Welcome to tonight's finance meeting for June 6 to take up the city budget. Uh, we'll be here for three long nights, ladies and gentlemen. Let's not be redundant. Let's get good questions, and we'll start out with the mayor giving us an overview of the budget. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Oh, gee, I've got the sun right in my eyes here. Can I wear my sunglasses? Can I Sorry move just that. a little bit? I don't think it moves. Sure. Okay, I'm going to look a little to the side. Don't take it, uh, don't take it personally. <clears throat> I guess since we've got 100% attendance over here, I'll look this way. <laughs> First of all, uh, good evening, Mr. President, Councilors. It's a pleasure to appear before you tonight and present to you the fiscal year 2017 budget. Uh, I know, as the President just mentioned, we're going to spend at least three uh, long evenings uh, to enable you to conduct a comprehensive review of the budget. And we will have all of the department heads and myself uh, here at the appropriate times to answer your questions as best we possibly can. I thought it would help the process if I could, as we've done the past couple years, if I could take a few moments at the opening to just kind of preview for you, kind of give you a big picture, look at uh, what I feel some of the key points of the budget are and then I will uh, remain up here to review specifically the mayor's office budget with you. As we look at uh, this year's budget, there are really some, uh, some key points I'd like to, to bring out. First of all, this budget increases local aid to education by $2.3 million. And part of the significance of that is in the governor's budget, the one we're working with right now, only increases Brockton's Chapter 70 local aid to education by $300,000. So in this budget, we are making a commitment of $2 million of local city funds to supplement and provide an additional $2 million increase in funding because the 300000 proposed by the governor is just so insufficient. And without this additional $2 million of funding, I believe that there would have been <coughs> catastrophic cuts uh, in the delivery of services in the school budget. And we are, and I'll leave the review of the school budget to the superintendent a little later in the evening, uh, but we certainly are hoping that as the state completes its budget process that uh, there will be some additional aid forthcoming. And if it does materialize, we will work closely with the council and with the school committee to figure out how to best appropriate that money. Uh, by the way, this $2.3 million increase this year, this is our third budget of our administration, brings our three-year total to an $11.4 million a year increase in local aid to funding over the, the three budgets that I've prepared for you. This budget will also show a $2.2 million deposit to the stabilization fund bringing the balance in the stabilization fund up to about $5.3 million or $3 million above where it was at this point last year. And I'll talk about that in some more detail, but we do feel it is critical to the city's financial future that we have to replenish that stabilization fund that has been depleted over the last couple of years, primarily with the council's approval funding uh, the settling of city contracts, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. This budget also reduces the funding to the Brockton 21st Century Corporation by $50,000. I have been listening closely and carefully to a lot of the comments and concerns raised by councillors over the last few months. And in this budget, in essence, I am proposing to you a transition year so that we can work together to reconfigure and determine a new path for the city's economic development activities, including working together to bring the Campanelli Stadium Shaw's Center complex back under direct city control. And when we get into the budget, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And this budget also pays for a number of capital needs that are long overdue repairs to roofs at fire stations that have been leaking for years, uh, replenishing and rebuilding the number of police cruisers, adding some much needed snow equipment, snow removal equipment to the DPW, 
and also retiring nearly a million dollars of the debt that we still owe from the historic winter of last year in fiscal year 15. And the key to that is those capital needs and the retiring of that debt will be done with cash and not with borrowing, further strengthening the city's financial position. And I think at the end of, of all of this, you will also agree that we are continuing to show restraint on incurring additional property taxes on our homeowners and business owners. And for the third consecutive year, this budget will not require or will not call for the full two and a half uh, increase in the tax levy. I will be recommending an increase in the levy, but not for the full two and a half. The effects of not using the full two and a half over the past three years has saved the taxpayers and business owners and homeowners of this city a total now of $8 million in potential property taxes that we have left on the table and kept in the taxpayers' pockets. So let me touch on those each just in a little bit more detail. In terms of the educational funding, as I mentioned, uh, and I'm sure you're well aware that the governor's proposed budget this year, Chapter 70 formula to education, uh, potentially really hurts the city of Brockton. It, we are dramatically underfunded. And I know the superintendent will discuss this with you in more detail, uh, but for a gateway city, like Brockton with uh, 17,500 students with all the challenges that we face with our students to be in essence almost level funded by the governor this year uh, is ridiculous while you know our cost of doing business for the year go up by in the neighborhood of ten million dollars. Uh, so as I mentioned we are going we are putting in this budget an additional two million dollars into local aid to education over and above the governor's proposed 300,000 increase in Chapter 70, and we'll hope that there's some additional aid coming in July uh, when the House and Senate and governor agree on a final budget. But we did this year, for the first time in many years, fully fund at 100% the city's obligation to educational funding. Our stabilization fund needs some money in it. Uh, and the reason for the dip in the balance in the stabilization fund over the past couple of years is, is very apparent. When I took office two and a half years ago, the city has 17 collective bargaining units from the unions, union collective bargaining units. 16 of the 17 collective bargaining units in the city were working without a contract and most have been working for several years without a contract. Today, and matter of fact, the only one that had an agreement was the firefighters union, but that had not been paid for yet. They'd agreed upon it, but we actually funded that during my first year in office. Today, two and a half years later, we have 16 out of the 17 unions working with a current collective bargaining agreement today. That means we've settled 17 contracts in the last two and a half years, and they almost all, if not all, required retroactive payments for pay raises and other benefits because of the fact union members had been working without a contract. And so it was the right thing to do, it was the necessary thing to do, but there's no doubt that the funding of those union contracts depleted the stabilization fund and the cost of those contracts with your approval uh, was paid out of the stabilization fund bringing the balance down to a low this past year of 2.3 million. We've made some additional deposits uh, with your approval during the year and with the additional 2.2 million in tonight's budget uh, will bring us up to 5.3 million dollars in the stabilization fund or a full three million dollars above where that balance was exactly a year ago. Now in order to fund, the money's got to come from somewhere. So in order to fund this 2.2 million dollar contribution, let's see if I can get this just a little lower, 
in order to fund this $2.2 million appropriation into the stabilization fund, this budget does recommend utilizing 1.9% of the available 2.5% levy under Prop 2.5. The entire amount of revenue raised by that 1.9% increase is going directly into the stabilization fund. It's a painful but necessary step to maintain the city's finances. In essence, we have balanced the budget based upon the current tax levy, but I'm making the decision and the recommendation to you that we do need to utilize 1.9% to raise the funds necessary to replenish that stabilization fund. And I think it's critical for the city's financial stability and it's also important as we go through our next round of review by the bond rating agencies that we be able to maintain our current high bond ratings. We've also had a commitment that's continued in this budget for public safety staffing. This FY17 budget increases police staffing to 195 officers. That is the highest staffing level of the Brockton Police Department in over 35 years. It also funds two new positions in the police department, two new civilian positions, a crime analyst, and that person has recently joined the city, and also a director of communications and community outreach. And I believe that as we look at community relations with police departments in cities across the country that particularly in a city with the diversity of Brockton that it's essential that we build a bridge of communication between the police department and the residents of the city and that's what this job will do that's what this individual when selected will do is they will lead not just our communications but they'll be the director of community outreach this is a model that's been successfully used in many other cities and in essence this will build, this person will build a civilian bridge between the residents of the city and the officers who are sworn to protect them. This budget also maintains our firefighter staffing at 194 and the importance there is that 194 includes the 12 new firefighters that we just put on a couple of months ago who just graduated from the academy and joined <coughs> the ranks a couple of months ago. So compared to three years ago in our first budget there is an increase in eight positions in the police department and an increase of seven positions in the fire department for a total net increase of 15 positions in public safety. <coughs> During extremely difficult and tough financial times we are increasing our commitment to public safety and some may ask me if we can afford to do that and I will maintain to you counselors that we cannot afford not to do that. Also in this year's budget you will also see a couple of other key positions added that I believe are critical to the city's future. One is a citywide grants coordinator. This is a position that's long overdue would have recommended it to you last year if we could have found the funding. Right now in the city of Brockton, as we face these tough financial times and these budgets aren't getting any easier, it's essential that we be tapping into and doing the most effective job we can in obtaining grant funding at every opportunity. And in today's world of grant funding, almost all grants require collaboration between multiple either city or private nonprofit agencies. Very few grants are just awarded to one entity anymore. And so we have all these different groups both inside and outside city government that are writing grant applications, being successful on some, bringing money in. But as an example, we have BayWIB writing grant applications. We have Brockton Area Transit seeking grant funding. We have two hospitals seeking grant funding not to mention our own police department, fire department and school department who all write grant applications. But everyone in this grants world is operating within silos and sometimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. 
and we can be far more effective if we have an experienced grant writer who from above on the city's behalf will coordinate all of the grant writing efforts in the city and there is no doubt that that position will pay for itself several times over in increased grant funding coming into the city of Brockton. Some of that directly into the city coffers and also going into other agencies that are doing good work that benefit the residents of the city and will help us to form more of those strategic collaborations that will result in successful rather than disappointing results on grant awards. There's also a proposed conservation agent slash planner in the planners department and this is continuing our joint commitment to rebuild that planning office. Uh, we've made great strides over the past couple of years but our staffing in our planning office is still not comparable to other cities the size of Brockton. We can see positive results coming from the investment we've made so far and right now a lot of this um, the conservation agent portion of the job is being completed utilizing an outside consultant working with the board we feel the boards we feel this will be a much better investment to bring some of that work in-house have it done by the city itself within the planning office and also this person will then be able to work on other planning activities along with providing more support to our citizen boards that rely on technical advice like conservation planning in ZBA and finally there's some funding in the veterans uh, office for not a permanent city employee but to fund a part-time position contracted from the veterans administration to provide a veterans service officer and this would only be a 20 hour a week part-time job contracted through the VA but we need assistance in helping our veterans we just don't have the staffing office currently in our veterans agents office to do the kind of outreach that we're challenged with doing today. We have veterans facing challenges with housing, with employment, with mental health issues, with substance abuse issues and we need someone representing the city's veterans agent doing outreach work, outreach work, outreach work in the community and when you review that veterans uh, agents budget a little bit later this evening uh, I know that Dave is prepared to provide you with a complete description of what the job duties would be of that part-time position in terms of B21 as I said I think I've heard the sentiment of the council loud and clear in terms of us coming to a decision that it's time to go in another direction with many of the activities that have been provided by Brockton 21st Century Corp. So you'll notice, first of all, right up front, I've reduced the funding by $50,000. I think there's a sentiment among the council to start moving away from the funding of B21 as it's been done in the past, and we're taking that initial first step with you. But beyond that, what I'd like to work with the council on is using a transition year to set the stage to go completely in another direction in terms of the economic development activities that are funded by the city in terms of the oversight and the ownership of the stadium and I think that we can take some halfway steps to do that in this year's budget and then work together over the next year to come up with those long-term solutions it's not as simple as just say take the stadium back from B21. We have to work together with the attorneys to figure out what is the best form of ownership for the city to take that stadium back under. Is it a stadium authority? Is it expanding the authority of one of the existing authorities? Is it bringing it back into parks and recreation? How are we going to own it, own it manage it, supervise it? That's not an overnight decision we need a transition year to work on that together but I am committed to working with you over the next year to bring that stadium complex back under city control in the interim the remainder of the funding that I have left in there the two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars will have some conditions included in the contract that have not been included in the past we will first of all and this part does not 
directly involve city funds, but just in the spirit of looking at the entire B-21 operation, um, I have recommended that we move the Main Street manager out of B-21. That funding comes from the BRA with CDBG funds. The employer of record will become the um, Mass Housing, um, Southeastern Mass Housing Corporation, the nonprofit subsidiary of the Brockton Housing Authority. They are a qualifying entity to contract with the BRA to provide us with the Main Street Manager, but with a significant difference. SMAC will only be the employer of record for things like providing the payroll, paychecks, office space, phone, etc. However, the contract will now specify that the Main Street Manager will report to and be supervised by the City's Director of Planning and Economic Development, Rob May. So in essence, the Main Street Manager will continue, I think with a somewhat refocused mission, but now reporting directly to the City's Director of Planning and Economic Development. And again, that particular position is not funded with City funds, but I just want you to see that in terms of the overall proposed changes to B21. I will also add conditions to this year's contract with B21, and these will have to be approved by their board, but our funding will be conditional on their board's acceptance of these conditions. And the first one is that the maintenance of Campanelli Stadium will be overseen by the su city's superintendent of buildings. Not necessarily is he doing the work or paying for the work, but it gives us our own uh, superintendent of buildings having direct oversight on what maintenance is done and how much is spent for it and ensuring that the money is spent is being spent properly and that the work that's being completed is being completed properly. We will also add language that will bring the B21 executive director position uh, under the supervision of the city's director of planning and economic development. So while that position will be continued to fund to be funded this year uh, through our reduced allocation to B21, the work duties being completed by that executive director will now come under the supervision of the city's director of economic planning and economic development. I think that those are some pretty significant moves in a short period of time to address concerns that have been raised by this council in terms of how the money that we're spending is being overseen and what really is the best model for the future going forward. And I believe that this will be a transition year so that when we're having this conversation with next year's budget, we will have a plan in place to bring that stadium back under permanent city control and to bring that economic development position back in-house and no longer fund those things through the Brockton 21st Century Corp. And I'll answer your questions on that as we go through the mayor's budget. That's contained in the mayor's budget. We're also uh, utilizing an overlay surplus this year. And over the course, as you saw in your materials, of reviewing several past tax years, the city assessor has declared an overlay surplus of in the neighborhood of $2.5 million. That money in this budget is being appropriated to a number of critical one-time needs. You don't use a one-year chunk of money that's not going to be there again next year to create positions that will still have to be paid for next year. What we've done with this block of money that's become available is to identify critical one-time needs that need to be funded in this budget and apply those funds to those needs. As an example, $825,000 going towards retiring another chunk of last year's snow removal deficit, nearly a million dollars in capital outlays, roofs on fire stations, police cruisers, IT, repairs to the city hall elevator, DPW snow removal equipment. Those are all critical needs that cannot go on any longer. These department heads have been asking for help for several years now and we're at the point that some of these things just have to be addressed 
and by utilizing this funding from the overlay, it's going to allow us to address all of these capital needs and deficit reduction, paying cash rather than borrowing. And there's a breakage excess of about $100,000 when you pay all those other things off from the overlay, and that joins the $2.2 million going into stabilization. It's a little more going into the stabilization. It seems like a pretty ambitious budget, and it is under the constraints that we have operating city government nowadays and between uh, facing the ongoing underfunding of local government by the state. And our local aid from the state a few years ago was cut by about $8.5 million. That money has never been restored. And each year we have a structural deficit of in the neighborhood of $10 million in the city budget. The cost of running the city goes up 12 or 13 million a year. S state local aid goes up two or three. And it face, it, we're faced each year with this structural deficit. This year, for the second consecutive year, there is very good news around new growth. New growth in our tax base, both residential and commercial. And this year, the assessor is estimating a $1.7 million increase in new growth over last year. Combined with last year's new growth, it totals over $4 million in new growth. It's the largest two-year period of new growth in the city's history. That new growth is not appreciation in current market values. New growth is real new values. New growth is building of new homes, additions to existing homes, businesses purchasing real estate, commercial property, businesses investing in commercial, personal property. And we're up across the board. And I think that it's clear that the long-term answer to Brockton's ability to provide essential city services and meeting the educational needs of our children is dependent upon the growth of the tax base. We will never do it just going back to the same people and asking them for more and more each year. All that does is drive business out of the city rather than into the city. And I do believe that this record new growth over the last two years is an indicator that many of the economic development initiatives that we have initiated over the last two and a half years are bringing results. It's record new growth. So, counselors, uh, in, in summary, the FY17 budget increases our spending on schools. Brockton kids really do count. I'll steal the superintendent's line. We're adding public safety personnel. We're settling union contracts. We're adding to our reserves. We're investing in capital needs. And we're doing all of this while for the third consecutive year not utilizing the full 2.5% tax levy. And as I may have mentioned earlier, over three years now in this administration, not utilizing that full levy has kept $8 million in the pockets of our residents and taxpayers that were available to be taken in tax increases by the city. And on that, I'll conclude my remarks on the overall budget. And uh, Mr. President, be Thank happy you, to uh, uh, answer questions specifically on the mayor's budget. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, Council is obviously ambitious, uh, a lot of information there. The specific items we'll take inside those specific budgets when we get to that. Uh, and uh, just so the new councilors know, any cuts that we propose will be done on the last night of, of, the, uh, of the hearings. So at this point, we will take the may mayor's budget and uh, I believe Councilor Ranieri. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Give me one second, Councilor, just to get to my own page here. You've got a half a second left. I'm only kidding. All right, I'm with you, Councillor. Go ahead. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Good evening. Great. Pleasure and, to be and here. And just a comment. I do want to uh, thank you, as always, for being here and making a presentation uh, before the uh, Council in regards to uh, the next fiscal year's budget. And um, yes, it's very ambitious. And uh, I do say, uh, just before I have a couple of questions in regards to your budget, that uh, some of the comments that have been made uh, this evening are on a positive note, which I'm very pleased to see. Um, and I think it's some things that we've all been working towards in the last um, year or so, and even then some, but I think uh, you're right. You're listening to us and listening to the, to, the, to the people that we have to listen to. I think we're all listening to the same people. Um, that some of the uh, things that you proposed here, which are part of your uh, 
your budget, I think, are very, um, very well overdue, and that we need to need to make those changes and make those changes happen. So, right. um, thank you, Council. With that being said, um, I noticed um, in uh, in the budget, in your budget, if I'm correct, you do have the grants writing position that you are going to um, oversee. If I'm correct with that, yes, it's going to be with you, with you. And our, our intent is to um, negotiate that as a permanent union position, but to have it work out of the mayor's office because it's designed to be kind of a from above helping all the other agencies. But I do think it's going to be important to attract the right person to that job, uh, that there be some stability to the position. I think a mayor with a two-year term uh, halfway into it might have trouble attracting the highest quality candidate with not a whole lot of job security to offer. Correct. And I think to get the really high quality individual that we're going to want to see in that job, that we're going to have to make it a permanent position, not one that changes with each mayor's term. Exactly. And in, in the salary that you have um, set forth at 42700 uh, I think is pretty well adequate because, as, as you indicated, if the person knows what they are doing, and I'm sure yeah. they're going to, you're going to pay for that position and so then some. In the spirit of full disclosure, Councillor, we anticipate that when we get that position negotiated and approved with the union, that uh, the full year salary for that job, I think, will be more in the low to mid 50s. Um, sure. But we didn't fund quite the full amount because we know we won't have the person in the position on July 1st. Mm -hmm. So we, we funded it at about 80% of what we expect the annual salary will be. Um, but I've, I've looked at this with some other cities. It's a critical position. We've got to get every penny available exactly. into the city with grant money. We've got demographics that look good on grant applications. There are people out there looking to partner with us. We can't afford to miss opportunities. And we've got to get all of the different agencies and organizations and city departments who write grant applications working together rather than working independently. I, I've, I've said over the years that I've been involved, Mayor, and, and I've always said it very strongly, and, and you were involved in the school department as well. One of the greatest assets we always had with the school department was to have a grants writer because that grants writer, the monies that came in over the years that went to that department, not only just to the department itself, but we were able to utilize them in other areas to even benefit by, by uh, renovating our school buildings as well. Um, but that position there paid, it paid for itself over and over and over. And I always said, other mayors, I don't know why they just never saw fit to having a grants writer. Everyone would say, well, we do. We have someone at the police department. We have someone over here. But here, in City Hall, under your guidance, under the mayor's guidance. And I think that's a positive, and I think that's going to be beneficial to this city. I really, really do. Thank you. What, what you see in other cities is, is the sharing of research and sharing of information. So Brockton Area Transit's grant writer might be researching a grant opportunity, comes across something and says, eh, that's not really for us. But that may be an opportunity that some other entity here in the city could be pursuing. But right now, we're not, we're not all sharing that information. Part of what this grants coordinator will do is coordinate this research and information from all of the various grant writers and in an organized, coordinated basis, share it amongst everyone so that we don't miss any opportunities. So, and, and, and you're correct with that. So I do, I do commend you on, on that one and uh, you know, wish you the best of luck when we get the right person to, to work for us. As far as the um, 21st Century Corp, um, I'm pleased to see that. Um, I have had my own opinions in regards to that over the last several years. I, do not want to ever say or, or for them or any members of that organization to think that I don't think that they do a, a, a great job. They do. They're all volunteers. We know that and, and you know that. But I, I feel that we've come to the point where we have to do some work there and re restructure because it was a, it was a department or, or a corporation that was uh, begun so many years ago because it had to be done. And, and, and you know the former mayor sits here as a councillor right now. Um, and he was forced to have to do what he had to do back then because of the situation we had. But never to be what they were set out to be, to be the owners of, of a stadium. And that's my right. opinion. And I think everyone's seeing that now. So I think we're on the right step starting by, by doing what you're doing and for all of us to work together and to come into play and hopefully within the next year, next budget, so we'll have another proposal that we're moving in that right direction like you want to see us do. And, and uh, yeah, if we, have to, if we have to be the tenant, well, then we're the tenant because it's our asset. And I've always said that we need to protect the asset. It is our asset. So and I, I think, and I think a, some a of the start. interim steps bringing the maintenance under the 
uh, purview of the city's building superintendent and being the, bringing the activities of the executive director under the supervision of the city's director of planning and economic development uh, gives the city much greater control over the funds that we are allocating over there this year, much greater oversight from the city side. I do believe that there is a very important role for the business community in partnering with the city on economic development. I just don't think this is the best model. And I think we can look at Lowell and Haverhill and now Lawrence, and we've been spending some time looking at the Lawrence partnership, and I want to work with the business community to whether it's a redirection of a revamp B21, or I think far more likely the beginning of a new entity that is business driven, but is not funded by the city, that is self-funding. And then we'll work in partnership with them to bring business into the city and help grow business in the city. But I think that, uh, I, I think that a, a structure in which it's business driven, but also supported by business rather than the city uh, can be far more effective and let's get the stadium and the economic Correct. development job back in house. Correct. And I, and I think by putting the, uh, th that position over to uh, you know, the city uh, planners, Department of Economic Development Planning uh, Office, I think is, a, is the right move as, as well. And then we take that in another step as well, whatever direction you have to take. So that, those are, uh, you know, some of the things I see within your budget that I think are, are very positive. Um, and then I would just only commend you on the fact that you're trying to keep the levy, as we all want to do, to keep that in, in uh, a re reasonable way that the taxpayers are still going to somewhat at least see that we're trying to do what we can for them. Uh, it's not easy. And I think, as we all know, uh, I think you indicated, um, it is a great plus and a great positive to what we're, we're seeing, not only within your own mayor's budget, but even the budget itself. But we're far from being out of the woods as well. We still have some work to do. Um, the state needs to help us the best that we can. We, we need to count on some of that. Um, but I think what you're doing uh, within your department, I think, is, uh, is in the positive direction right now. So I, I commend you on that. And, uh, and thank you uh, right. for answering those questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, you. Counselor. Anyone else? Councilor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Councilor. Thank you for your, uh, for your really in-depth analysis and information. I just I kind of wanted to piggyback on uh, the Ward 3, Councilor. Um, I, I, I really uh, applaud you relative to uh, the B21. I guess my question would be, Mr. Mayor, is, is in terms of um, Mr. May and his capacity, I mean, he's pretty stretched thin right now, mm -hmm. but in essence, he'd be watching over the conservation agent slash planner and then also the executive director. He, he's, he's comfortable that he can handle that? I, 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 we meet all the time. Uh, I think that uh, I think not only is he requested and, and encouraged this position, uh, but he'd like to continue to build the office more in the future. I mean, I think if you go down to New Bedford, you know, they've got like you know, nine or ten people working in their planning office. Other cities up in Lowell, they have like 12. I mean, we're still nowhere near what other cities uh, have for resources in their planning departments. But, you know, I, I think we've got to be realistic in terms of what money we've got available in the budget. I think we have to spend it very wisely. Um, this position will not completely pay for itself, but it will partially pay for itself because you'll see in that planning uh, budget, when, when you review that, we're paying for outside consultant services uh, out of that planner's budget. And as we get our own person in, we're going to be able to bring not all, because some of the specialized work still has to be done by an outside consultant, but we're going to be able to bring a good chunk of that work in-house, and I think in next year's budget you'll see us reducing the request on the line item for the outside consultant in that department. So I'm not portraying that it would be fully funded by the savings on outside uh, consultant, but I am saying that a portion of the cost of that position will come from savings. Okay, thank you on that. And in terms of your... And the other, if I could just add, Councilors, we looked around at a lot of other... There are a lot of communities, much smaller than Brockton, that have in-house conservation agents. It's, it's, really, it's really typical in most communities. We're, we're lagging behind. Absolutely. Um, in terms of your actual line items on the full-time and part-time salary, um, when I look at um, department requested versus recommended, uh, on the full time, it's it's about an increase of 65, almost 66 grand, 65, 646, and then the 22,000 even on the part time. Um, just to kind of follow up with what Councilor Yaneri said, 
the, the, the grant writer that's going to fall into the capacity of the mayor's office, wh where does that, I mean, that's almost combined 90 grand. What, what, could you explain to, to the council again the breakdown on that? Yeah, sure. So there are several factors there, council. First of all, there is the funding for the, the grant writing position, and that's uh, roughly half or a little more than half of the total. Uh, also in there, we've got some increased costs for the, and you'll have to help me with the job, the, the specialized secretary that's in the office. That position was a non-union position in the mayor's office in the past during the collective bargaining agreements of the past year. Uh, through the collective bargaining process, that position was bargained into the union, so we have to provide some additional benefits and stipends, and there's a small salary increase that is negotiated into the collective bargaining agreement. We're obligated for those things. And then I have built in with all of the positions, and Council, you're going to find this consistently uh, throughout the budget uh, over the next three nights, um, that we have budgeted about a 5% increase for non-union employees. Um, now, most of those raises are subject to ordinance, and the Council will ultimately decide whether those, uh, whether those increases are granted or how much is granted and that's pending in front of your ordinance committee right now. Uh, however, from a budgetary standpoint, uh, if we're going to be able to do it, we've got to anticipate it, build the money into the budget. If on those positions that come under ordinance, that amount is not granted, then obviously the difference won't be spent. We can't spend money that you don't appropriate. Um, in terms of other non-union jobs, like the people in the mayor's office, the math on it was pretty simple. This is the third budget over these three budgets, the union employees have received a five and three quarter percent uh, increase. The non-public safety unions that would be most comparable, the people that work in the buildings and the city departments, their raises over the three years that have been settled add up to five and three quarters percent. I think there's an equity fairness issue that we ought to treat the non-union employees who are small in number but work just as hard and are just as committed to the city that we have an obligation to give them a comparable increase as to what the other employees have been have earned and have been granted through the collective bargaining process. So there is a 5% across the board increase for the positions in the mayor's office plus some increased costs to the, the person I call the office manager, although that's not I'm sure you all know who I'm referring to, the long-term employee in the mayor's office that spans several administrations. That position went into the union this year, comes with some extra stipends and benefits in the union that were not previously provided. We're funding those, and we're funding that um, uh, citywide grants coordinator position. So, Mr. Mayor, I, I just there's only five of us that sit on the ordinance committee. Mr. Chair, just, just point of information for those that don't sit. Uh, this matter came before the Ordinance Committee recently, and, and the wisdom of the, of the collective five of us, we postponed it until after this budget. Um, but I just, I just want to make sure I understand that 5% that buffer that's factored in right now, what, what would be the, the total amount across the board? 100 it's, grand? It's, no, not the... Jay here, can you help me with this? I don't have my printer. Let me just get you the page, okay? No, I believe that, in, that includes the cost of the the uh, citywide grants coordinator is included in it's that. It's baked number. into that. Yeah. Just doing some quick math, Counselor. Thirty to thirty-five thousand is what's attributable to those pay increases. The rest is the um, citywide grants coordinator projected salary and the uh, increases for the one position that I described here that went into the union. Okay. And then my, my last my last. And I, and I should say, for, for purposes of uh, of being um, fully transparent, I don't get the five percent. The mayor gets an increase each year by statute. It's tied into some sort of cost of living index. I inherited it. I didn't ask for it. And this year it's a very small amount. I, it's less than 1%. Uh, Mr. Mayor, my last question, and you're right about that. Thank you. Um, my last question is relative to um, the positive um, uh, facts that you gave us about hiring, um, public safety, uh, and all the other different um, endeavors. Um, 
are, are you are you comfortable? Because when I read the CFO certification, again, it's, it's certified just for fiscal year 2017, but he does put the uh, the caveat in there about our OPEB liability and, and the like. So, so you're, I know you mentioned you don't want to bring someone on, and then next year you're going to have to let them go. Right. But you're comfortable with yes. It's a, it's a, the total over three years is a total increased net of 15 positions between police and fire. No, no, no. I'm not just talking about public okay. safety. I'm talking in, in total. Right. So well, besides those positions, I think it's three positions being added and one part-time position being funded through a contract. Yeah, I think, they're, I think they're all essential positions. I think we've got to invest in planning. I think we've got to invest in our, uh, having a citywide grants coordinator. Um, I think we, it's a part-time position, but we've got to do a better job helping our vets. Um, I don't know, what, what's the other one I didn't mention? I don't have them all written in front of me now. They're key essential positions. Okay. And I think that your, your, your take on OPEB liability is, is accurate. All, all municipalities and cities are saddled with huge OPEB liability. I think actually when I was at a seminar recently and they compared Brockton to other cities our size, we're actually among gateway cities. We're one of the healthiest among the gateway cities. However, we've all got a big problem and it's not going to be a problem we can just fix by ourselves. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else? Uh, I actually, I'm just going to make a comment. Um, the, the sun in your eyes uh, actually affects you, but to be honest uh, with you... It's out of my eyes now, Mr. Well, President. Well, but this room uh, comes under the purview of the city clerk, but you have a line item that the people that are most affected are the people at home trying to watch this on cable TV. Maybe you could work with the uh, revolving fund for the mayor's uh, cable no, so, access. So to be completely clear on that, I've for some time now already approved uh, with uh, Mr. Lindy whatever he needs to do to make for upgrades to improve the quality of the broadcast from the city hall chambers. I'd, I'd like to see us have even more capabilities. I'd, I'd like us to be able to also broadcast live from the... Uh, Emergency Operations Center at Beamer. I think there could be situations where being able to get out live information in an emergency situation over through the cable system uh, would be helpful. Uh, but uh, I am uh, I'm already fully committed to whatever Mr. Lindy says he needs to do to uh, upgrade the services here. I, I, I appear, so on, I appear on these shows regularly also, Mr. Yeah. President. I wouldn't mind looking a little better at home. <laughs> <laughs> we can't buy cameras that good. I'm but. hoping you'll get something that makes me a little taller, well, thinner, full head of hair. We will work with the city clerk in the building department, and hopefully we can uh, pay for current. <laughs> if that costs that extra, money is no object. <laughs> Any you other questions? You want HDTV. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilors. Uh, Madam Clerk, item number two. Planning Board, David Wheeler, Chairman. Good evening, Mr. May. Good evening, Mr. President. Just for the record, I am not David Wheeler, um, <laughs> but I am here on his behalf to speak about the uh, Planning Board appropriation. And, Councilors, this is the Planning Board, not the, uh, right. not the Planning Department. We'll get to that a little later. Um, any statement or any questions? Uh, we've had a very busy year in the planning department, uh, re reviewing uh, uh, both uh, drafts of new proposed uh, ordinances, zoning ordinances and legislation. Um, also, uh, we've just completed a downtown comprehensive plan, uh, or downtown um, action strategy, excuse me. <coughs> And the planning board is, is part of the process for kicking off the uh, citywide comprehensive plan, a blueprint for Brockton. I hope most people uh, here and at home have seen uh, that's on our web page and at uh, www.ablueprintforbrockton.com. Um, but um, we are asking for a, uh, a level appropriation this, this next year. Um, and we'll take any questions. Any questions? 
Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman, I just had oh, one question. Council Sullivan. Good evening, Mr. May. Good evening, sir. Um, thank you for what you're doing for the city. Um, my question is relative to the line item for the consultant at $65,000, which was the request and the recommended. Could you just again explain, there's a lot of new councilors on, on, the, on the council. Could you just explain again what that sixty-five grand actually pays for? Um, I, I, Councilor, is that Councilor, in the this planning is the, board? Or? The, this planning the planning board, board not budget. the... Not the Planning and Economic Development Department. Oh, okay. I'm, a, I'm ahead of the game. Yeah. We'll get to the Planning Department on number nine. That's the same question I'll ask yeah. in a couple yeah. minutes. I'm sure. I'm ready for that. I'll put a pin in it. Pioneer. <laughs> Any other questions for the Planning Board? Seeing none, thank you, thank you uh, sir. Mr. May. Item number three. Conservation Commission, David Zaff, Chairman. And again, <laughs> I'm here to uh, represent Mr. Zaff and the Conservation Commission. Uh, we have a very um, productive year at the Conservation Commission. Uh, as you may or may not know, uh, the, con the Commission is responsible for overseeing the um, state wetlands ordinances and uh, some of the stormwater ordinances that uh, uh, are stormwater law from, for the state of Massachusetts. Uh, they uh, usually meet with developers in the field, verify wetlands, um, work with uh, adjacent properties on stormwater runoff. Um, this year we are asking to bring a uh, new position uh, pending um, collective bargaining into our fold for a uh, full-time conservation agent and um, planner. Uh, this would eventually replace and phase out the consulting firm that we've been working with, Nova Armstrong. They've been a, a very positive group of people to work with and, and we're really pleased with the work they've done. But by bringing this in-house, we think that we're going to be able to offer more value both to um, departments within the city, including DPW and uh, the Parks Department, but also be hands-on boots on the ground in our community doing the things that, that we need to do. Any other Thank questions? You. Thank you, Mr. Uh, May. Thank you, sir. Item number four. Traffic Commission. Oh, that's Captain not Captain DeBay. <laughs> You'll be back. Good evening, Captain. Good evening. Do you have any, any statement or anything to tell us? Uh, no, uh, we're level funded with the exception of uh, we're asking for $12,000, uh, special line item for uh, field study and engineering uh, design costs for signals throughout the city, traffic signals. Councilor Ianieri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Captain. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Just in... Um, you know, reviewing the mission statement, um, because I know the Traffic Commission's responsibilities uh, with the line painting and also with traffic uh, um, signs and repair traffic control signals, does it also fall under, I mean, street signs also come under traffic somewhat, do they not? Correct. Yes, they do. Over replacing or, or putting new street signs there? Okay. Yes. I, I think at some point, I, I don't see where it's really highlighted under the... Uh, um, you know, under the mission statement, maybe the next time next year you can maybe correct that just so it has that under there because I think that's just as, as important as, uh, as everything else as well. Okay. okay. Mr. Chairman, and if I, if, if, uh, I might, um, if you can just allow me just a little leniency in, in a <coughs> comment. A little. Just a little because I, I we'll think we have to because we only see this person when we're doing the traffic budget and that's this is Patty Florio who will be retiring at the end of this um, month and I think she's done an outstanding job. She inherited uh, this traffic position under the Harrington administration when there was some reconstruction of, of the traffic department itself and not only does she work in the legal department, she had to pick up this helm, but Patty's been a champion to all us ward councilors, even Councilor Lodge. When you call her, um, she's right there, and, and believe it or not, within 24, 48 hours, whatever you've asked for has always been corrected, and that's with her and, and, and the help of the DPW and even with the help of the captain that's, that's been there and captains in the past. So, I mean, she deserves a great round of applause. She really does. Thank you, Council. For and Patty, even if the chairman had said no as the dean of the council, I was going to say it anyway, so no matter what. But anyhow, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Captain. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Captain thank Barry. You. Next item, Madam Clerk. Council on Aging, Janice Fitzgerald, Director. Good evening. Good evening, Councillors. Any statement? Um, yep, I just have a brief statement for you. I knew a you would. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, I learned something this evening. I learned that Brockton has just about as many seniors as there are students in the Brockton public schools. So I found that to be quite interesting. Um, as far as my budget, I'm thankful there were no cuts this year. I was disappointed that my request for additional staffing was not granted at this time. We cannot continue to provide services for our um, elder population as they are growing with a staff of two and a half. We too are dealing with homelessness, mental health issues, abuse, among other needs of our elders. We welcomed over 300 new members since last year. We average 80 to 100 visits a day. My outreach staff saw 638 people in a year. In this year, we have over 1,000 elders turning 65 in the city of Brockton, which is also going to put additional strain on the center and my outreach team. We no longer can continue at this pace. I agree that Brockton kids count. I also need to say our Brockton seniors count. So with that, I will be happy to answer any questions. Council Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Janice. Ms. Fitzgerald, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I was actually going to bring that up, and uh, I'm glad you brought the fact that uh, you are a department of two and a half. Yes. And when we look at, when we, look at uh, we all know that the baby boomers are getting um, closer to the, uh, the, the age of uh, utilizing more services from the uh, Council on Aging. And I think um, as the, you know, because you and I have had this conversation so for several times uh, in terms of even reaching out into the diversity in our, in our communities, because we do know that uh, aging happens uniformly. It doesn't really matter what you come from or what you do, what you say. Uh, but I think it's important for, um, for the Council of Aging to be moving towards um, that particular direction, because we do know that there's a great need within, um, within the, the, the city in general, uh, but more specifically as it deals with seniors within the ethnic communities. And we know that you, right now you don't have that, that capability in the sense because you don't have the personnel to be, be able to do that. So my hope is that with this new person coming in in terms of a, a grant writer, that one of the first priorities will be mm -hmm. to seek out funds to help diversify the, uh, the staffing within the uh, the Council on Aging to be able to provide those much needed services to the, to, to, to the entire city in a sense. Uh, you and I had a conversation the other day with regards to uh, the, the, the food bank and some of the, the food available to the, the various different communities, but it, it becomes very difficult to, uh, to get in touch with people that are uh, perhaps non-English speaking, uh, not quite un that don't quite understand how uh, things kind of function here. So I think it's important for, um, you know, for the council and agent to be moving in that direction. And I'm going to leave it here that I will work with the mayor or anybody else that we need to work together to make sure that, you know, the next time that you come before us next year or even as we progress that you do have the amount of, um, of bodies and staff to be able to, uh, to provide the services that we, are, we greatly need in this community. And again, I appreciate all the work that you do because as you said, I was at Brockton High School for the graduation. That's a lot of people. Um, uh, so <coughs> it's important for us to uh, basically support the seniors in our community. And I hope that uh, 
you know, my fellow councils will do the same thing, and the mayor will do that so that you can actually uh, have the, the necessary staff that you need to be able to provide the services in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Ranieri. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I'll just be brief because I echo some of the same uh, comments that my uh, city councilor at large has, has mentioned as well. And uh, when I heard you, when I heard you, excuse me, make the comment that uh, we can't keep up with some of the additional resources because of what you're just dealing with within your own budget and not enough to do it. Um, I also would, would echo the same that, you know, hopefully that when the grant right is in place that we're able to do some of these things that we're maybe losing out on right now. And I think that that I think is going to be helpful and positive to you um, because there's no doubt um, the one thing you don't want to, you don't want to lose the fact that you're all of a sudden shirking a, a duty because you're not trying to because everything is growing a little bit, you know, a little bit faster. So um, I, I'll do whatever I can as well and, and make sure that that happens. I, I was looking through the, your line items and I was still looking at that line item to, you know, how the aging process begins, but I've yet to see where and how that, you didn't come up with any program for that yet, though, did you? No. No. Okay. Thank you. She was just looking at you. Thank, Thank you, you, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Ms. Fitzgerald. Um, you were just here a few weeks ago on a resolve, <laughs> um, and, and you do yeoman's work every day, and, and you are severely understaffed. There's, there's no question about that. And, and it's proven by the fact that the Mary Cruz Kennedy Council on Aging Center is going to be added on. It's going to be built. So he's going to get more people coming there. Um, when that happens. Um, one thing I just want to make it clear, I got two calls from people that said, Council Sullivan, please give Janice more money. And <laughs> unfortunately, you no know, people don't understand, the City Council can increase that. I just want to make that clear because if we could, we definitely would. So thanks for all you do and hopefully we can work together to benefit you. Thank you. Was, Thank one, you. Of, was one of those people my husband? <laughs> <laughs> How'd you know that? Put it back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. That's good. Thanks. Anyone else? Thank you, and thank you for the work thank you do. You. Yeah. Next item, Madam Clerk. Veteran Services, David Farrell, Director. Good evening, Councillors. Good evening, David. Mr. Farrell. Um, Any statement? Uh, yes, uh, I'd just like to uh, express my sincere gratitude to uh, <coughs> the ongoing and continuing and uh, <coughs> uh, Oh, the support that you've always provided, uh, my, my staff, myself, and uh, the Office of Veteran Services in the City of Brockton. We couldn't do what we do without your support, and uh, we're just very grateful for it. Thank you. Uh, that said, uh, this year's budget, 2017, I have, uh, uh, it's pretty much uh, flat uh, in the um, area of veterans' cash benefits, a, a slight reduction as I see a small drop-off in the need for uh, veterans cash benefits. Uh, we might be under 900000 this year at the uh, conclusion of uh, this month. Um, I am asking for um, funding for a uh, outreach and uh, peer support specialist for my office. Uh, this individual would uh, interact with uh, the Veterans Administration. We have a lot of um, a lot of our clients, a lot of our veterans have um, issues which require treatment at the VA and uh, I don't really have the time to go up there and uh, interact with them and there are other problems with my, my presence there in terms of um, um, barriers uh, for uh, knowing things about the veterans who are treated there. I, um, for the most part, our financial assistance and medical aid to veterans, I have to have kind of a uh, bureaucrats, uh, arm's length um, relationship with veterans in order to view the, uh, um, the progress of their uh, efforts to find work or to maintain uh, a level of um, sobriety in the community. So for that reason, a lot of times I have to be kind of a, uh, an enforcer as opposed to a uh, um, big brother. And I think that this position would be uh, very helpful for my office to extend that kind of uh, helpful big brother approach to uh, assisting veterans, uh, men and women, who, who are dealing with uh, issues that are beyond my uh, capacity to work with uh, in the office I uh, occupy. Councilors? If I might, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Stadensky. David, if you might answer this. I don't know if you can or not. Today being the anniversary of D-Day, World War II. How many of the greatest generation do we have in Brockton still here? I, I would guess about 350. 
uh, we're still remaining. We're about two veterans in the city of Brockton. That's a, a real wag, as we used to say, because uh, I don't have hard numbers. I'm just going on uh, my interaction with the, v the VA and uh, uh, the media to some extent. Thank, thank you very much, and yes, thanks sir. to them, and thanks to all the veterans. Thank you, thank you Councilor. Councilor Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Farrell, how are you? Fine, thank you. Uh, you have on your um, on your on uh, your budget form here uh, a position that's open and unfunded uh, called the Grave Registration Officer. Yes. What sir. exactly is that? That individual was charged with uh, tracking the um, death of veterans and marking f within the city. Uh, where they were buried, uh, whether at Melrose, uh, Calvary, or one of the other cemeteries. Uh, for the most part, it was either Melrose or Calvary. Uh, and uh, it hasn't been funded in a number of years. So does that mean we're not keeping tabs in terms of where the veterans are being buried now? Well, th with the assistance of the Veterans Administration, all veterans' graves are marked either by uh, vertical stone or plaque. Uh, and that, it, that through that means I'm able to identify veterans' graves who have died since 1990. Um, that said, prior to 1990, uh, there weren't, um, not every veteran got a marker uh, if they were, they already had a private uh, memorial stone. Uh, so w we left it really to the fraternal organizations to mark the stone uh, with whether or not they were veterans. Is that, now, is that a position that you see in the future as a position that you would like to fill? Well, uh, yeah, it would be, it'd be wonderful to fill it. Uh, if uh, it, it, it's, it's really kind of a retired person's uh, position and uh, requires interaction with, um, you know, the funeral homes and uh, making sure that uh, you have accurate uh, depictions of the cemeteries uh, in the city. It's, you know, it can be done, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty big job, believe it or not. Right. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Thank yes. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else? Thank you. And Ms. Farrell, won't you stay there? Madam Clerk, next item. Veterans Council, David Farrell, Director. Ms. Farrell, if you could give a brief explanation of Veterans uh, Council. And Certainly. The Veterans Council is really charged with the responsibility of uh, promoting the uh, uh, parades and uh, the decoration of graves once a year, Memorial Day. Um, we have two main events, uh, Veterans Day on November 11th and, of course, Memorial Day, the fourth Monday in May, um, which we just celebrated uh, last week. And uh, that, to some extent, we also assist um, the council in putting on a, um, a show at the VA on July 4th. It's usually a picnic, and uh, there's live music, and uh, uh, we fund that as well. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Item number eight. Animal control. Thomas Nchilla, supervisor. Good evening, Mr. Uh, President, fellow counselors. Um, I do not have an opening statement. I will uh, take any questions you may have and try to answer them to the best of my ability. Councilors, we'll give you a minute to... Get to your uh, tab. Okay. Any questions? Mr. Chairman. Councilor Farwell. I just have one. Uh, Monday through Friday operation, is that correct? Or do we, do we have animal control officers on duty on the weekend? We do um, the current hours of operation for the department are Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, Saturdays and Sundays, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. And we're on call after that for emergencies. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Officer DeGillis. Thank you, Councillors. Item number nine. Planner, Robert May. Planner. Come on up, Mr. Zaff. Good evening, Councillor. Good evening. Um, Anything oh, you want to say? Yes, it's been a very um, busy year in the planning department. We've been um, 
uh, obviously produced a uh, downtown action strategy, DIF, and urban renewal plan. Uh, we are kicking off a citywide comprehensive plan. Um, we intend to, um, with um, uh, or, or through the collective bargaining process, to create a new internal uh, position for um, a conservation agent and green planner, or and planner, excuse me. Um, and this is the first year that we're going to be looking at um, an allocation of the DIF funds, 40Q, although in the budget book it unfortunately says 40U. Um, that's um, on the second page of our, our proposed budget. So on page two, there's a typo? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir. Whereabouts? It's at the top line. It says um, uh, MGL 40U diff. It should actually read 40Q diff. That's page two. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it is page two. Oh, page two. No. Uh, it's page two of the uh, budget page itself. Oh, the budget page. The, Pardon me, sir. The landscape page. And, and <coughs> so it should be 40. Q. Q. Which is the district improvement financing that was approved by council. And that's a $230,000 line item. Yes, sir. With those funds, we're looking at um, beginning our downtown ambassadors program, the Clean Green Clean team. Um, we are also um, going to be working on, um, with your blessings, a uh, downtown uh, historic preservation district uh, using the local, local historic district designation. Uh, there's also some environmental assessment and survey work that we would like to do and uh, some marketing uh, activities, including uh, marketing, creating a downtown welcome guide, and um, some particular advertising related to specific buildings that we would like to be able to offer uh, for redevelopment. Councilor Sullivan, I believe you had questions, correct? I do. Mr. May, could you answer that $65,000 consultant line item? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, throughout the rest of the city, uh, where we don't have access to DIF funds, we do um, periodically conduct small studies. Um, in this case, uh, an example of, of or, or, or small services. In this, uh, an example of that would be under our um, new comprehensive plan process, we need to bring in uh, some assistance in language translation, uh, being able to um, provide someone at our various community meetings who speaks um, Cape Verdean Creole, Haitian Creole, and Spanish. Um, we also uh, will be bringing in uh, somebody to continue, well actually to continue the work that we started on uh, updating our GIS database. Uh, we need to know or figure out what the average width of a lot is. Right now we know the average square footage of a lot, but we couldn't tell you what the width of a lot is. Uh, and that's important I think as we look at rezoning the city. Uh, to figure out what the means are and uh, what is the right size of a lot in Brockton. Um, we also will be looking at um, other areas for historic study. Um, there are other area plans that we hope to produce. Um, there's some preliminary work that we'd like to do around the CSX site uh, to create a master plan uh, in that area. But um, these are all baby steps into a much larger uh, process and sometimes these funds do help us match particular grant opportunities. So it's a variety of consultants. There's a, a variety, variety of, of tasks. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ranieri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. May. Good evening, sir. And how are you this evening? Wonderful. You're so looking far. You're looking tremendous. <laughs> <laughs> look marvelous. Don't go too far now. <laughs> uh, correct me if I'm, if uh, or maybe just. Uh, work with me for a minute or two because I think I'm on the right track but in regards to the conservation uh, conservation agent planner position um, at this point in time conservation and planning work together pretty much hand in hand anyways do they not uh, I know over the years it's been a little different sometimes we 
did have a chairperson or two that, well, how do I say, diligent, easily to say that they thought they ran the show and forgot about everybody else sometimes, you know what I mean? But it's Sometimes um, true, yes. Right, exactly. So right now, though, they're working with, with the planning department as well as, um, you know, you being present even at Conservation com yes. Commission. Yes, we, we do staff the commission. Um, uh, uh, our executive, or our um, uh, staff secretary is, is at these meetings. Uh, right. Sometimes myself or um, the staff planner okay. will attend these meetings. Um, and um, the, the planning board, the Conservation Commission and Historic Preservation um, uh, District or uh, Commission, all are kind of under the auspices of the Planning and Economic Development Department. Okay, but this particular position in itself would definitely be working much closer with you, and much would closer. be would be the person he or she would be present at conservation meetings in regards to whatever is going to, going to yes, be transferred. Yes, because sir. most of that goes hand in hand, planning, department, conservation. Sometimes a project goes from zoning to planning and has to go to conservation. I mean, it, it goes in a three ring. Often, yes. Start, right, and then sometimes it gets lost some, somewhere. You know what I'm saying? And it m makes for difficulty for other businesses wanting to come into the city. That's my biggest concern. You know what I mean? I'm just trying yes. to make it... I'm trying to make it smooth, and I think that's what we're trying to do here as well, because I think I agree with what the mayor said. I think we're overdue with it, with the position, and I'm just wanting to make sure it is going to be smooth enough that it's going to go from zoning, if it goes to planning, and, and does in conservation. Everything's everybody's together or not. I didn't know nothing about that. I didn't understand. You know what I'm saying? <coughs> we are all on the same page. Okay, that's just. I just want to make sure that that's how it's going to flow. Yes. Because that again, I, I don't want to be repetitive, but. That's what brings business to the city is how we perform on some of these other boards, and that's what I'm looking for. It, 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 little minute details can just derail a, a development deal or a project, and, and we want to all be on the same page to promote uh, right, right, the, right. the best uh, deal for Brockton. Ex exactly, and that's, just what I'm, uh, that's what I want to see with the position. Okay, thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other questions, Councilors? Thank you, Mr. May. Thank, thank you for you, your sir. service. Item number 10. Board of Health, Louis Tatalia, Executive Director. Good evening, Mr. Tatalia. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Councilors. Councilors, second hand to get the tab open. <coughs> Any statement? No, it's basically that I have a level funded budget. How many is this for you? How many budgets? How many budgets is this for you? Um, 25, <laughs> not counting the school department. So it's I'm like 33. Councilor Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Tartaglia. Uh, you have on your budget uh, a funded but vacant public health nurse position. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not totally wrong, I could be. Uh, this is also the person that handles a lot of the duties of uh, uh, the TB medication distribution. Correct. So how have you been handling that since you don't have that position funded? Are you currently looking for somebody? Uh, well, I will this year because it is funded. Oh, it wasn't funded last it year? It wasn't funded last year. Uh, we thought the uh, position, the person would return, but it uh, didn't happen. So the person is still on workers' comp. Uh, what we've been doing is utilizing uh, two part-time uh, contract positions. Oh, to do the TB? To, to do the uh, flu clinics, um, the TB screening, um, TB outreach, and also the uh, uh, infectious disease reporting. Well, you are looking to fund the position and to basically staff the position as we go along this year, right? Right. The position will be filled this year. Okay. On another note, um, and Mr. Chairman, I don't know if I have to ask you for a little leeway, but it has to do with the, uh, the fluoridation, the fluoride program that we had discussed here. 
Yes, I'm still waiting for the um, state to come I up was, with something. I was actually informed that the funding is ready to go from the, from the, st from the standpoint of the state, which they will provide funding f for the installation, the materials, the equipment, and actually even the chemicals for a whole year. So, uh, and they're basically looking for your uh, next step in the sense to try to get in touch with you to figure that stuff out. So I just wanted to let you know that. Okay, well, who you, um, who you been talking to? Uh, Maria. Maria, okay, I, I have not heard anything to that. Yeah, she uh, basically fact. sent me an email saying. I mean, yeah, basically, I, um, I'm in a catch-22 situation. Um, I cannot spend any money because I don't have the money. If I do get money, I have to bring it before the council right. to accept the funds and to expend the funds. Uh, the first thing that we would need would be the funds for a, uh, a consultant to put the whole thing together. And we have three separate uh, uh, water sources and we need a consultant to tell us what equipment we are going to need um, for all three uh, areas. All right, so perhaps that's a conversation we can have offline. Offline. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's something, we, it's, it's there, but it's, 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 you know, who's on first as far as who takes the first step. I can't because I don't have the money, nor have I had the approval from the council to do anything. Okay. All right. Th thank you, Mr. Tethek. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Tataglia. Okay, in just one respect, um, on our uh, money that we take in on permits, uh, usually it averages about uh, $200,000, and uh, this year we should hit uh, $400,000. That's based on increases and also um, pushing the certificates of fitness. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Conn, is that going the general fund? Thank you. Thank you. Item number 11. Assessor John O'Donnell, Chairman. Good evening, Mr. O'Donnell. Good evening. You have an opening statement? Yeah, the assessor's office will be involved with a uh, full reval this year as required by the Department of Revenue. Uh, increase in costs is um, personal property uh, reval is 105000 Real property reval is uh, 203700 dollars And uh, we're also going to have a um, position to eliminate or retiring, and we're not going to fill the position. Councilor Farwell. Good evening, Mr. O'Donnell. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of questions. Uh, the reval, when someone, when the revaluation team goes out in the field, they go to a house, it's supposed to be a two-family, they find it's converted into a three-family. Do you share that with the building department or with other appropriate city departments so that the appropriate action can come to... These uh, people don't physically inspect the properties. They don't. It's a street inspection. But yes, we do. Like Friday, I found a property myself that had an illegal apartment, and I contacted the building department. So they do a drive-by? They do a drive-by. Just a drive-by. But when we go out on permits and we find things, we, we report it. Okay. And with respect to setting the tax rate, it always comes in December. Is there anything that precludes us from doing that earlier in the year? Yeah, value's got to be certified. They're not certified to October, November. And is that the Department of Revenue? It, but is that based on the information we send in? Can but it's, that's when they certify all values in the state. Okay, and there's no way to uh, there's no way to expedite that. No. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else? Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. O'Donnell. Good evening. Um, in terms of what you said that you, you're going to have a, retire, a retirement and not fill it, is that what that um, line item, it was zero requested, but it's 20000 from the mayor recommendation for the separation costs? That's that what separation that costs. Yes. That's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else? Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. Thank, Thank you for you. service. Item number 
12. Treasurer Collector, Martin Brophy, Treasurer. For the new councils, you'll find you have a couple of different tabs in the uh, treasurers. Right now, we're doing the treasurer collector's office. Evening, councils. Evening, council. Good evening. Any statement? Uh, um, personally, I'd like to thank my staff. Um, it's they do a great job every day. We handle every dollar coming in and going out of the budget every year, and I just want to send my thanks to them. Thank you. Any questions for the treasurer collector portion of the budget? Seeing none, Councillor Rodriguez, are you just stretching your back or you're up? Yeah, no, I'm fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Let's, we'll now go to item number 13. Treasurer's Debt Service, Martin Brophy, Treasurer. Good evening, Mr. Brophy. Good evening. Actually, in, in Treasurer's debt, um, we had done a refunding during the current fiscal year. Um, so there actually is $123,000 worth in this area that can actually be reduced. Um, there were a new schedule that came out, and this had the old schedule. Thank you. Councilors? Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, next agenda item would be um, personnel. Agenda item number 14, Maureen Cruz, Director. Good evening, Ms. Cruz. Good evening, Councillors. Do you have a statement? I do have a brief statement. You will see in the personnel department budget some additional line items this year. The reason for that is um, a couple of things. We had decided that it was time to move the clerical staff that was in the personnel department that was ordinance that was sitting in jeopardy of not getting raises and benefits similar to other clerks. We have put them into the clerk's union, therefore they are entitled to additional benefits. Um, the um, for those uh, counselors that are new this year, there are four positions in the personnel department. Two of them are funded by the Health Insurance Trust Fund. So that is why the personal services is, is so low. And also as an FYI, the, the personnel department budget is the second largest budget in the city of Brockton next to the school department. We are staffed with four people to handle the personnel department budget. And the health insurance increased this year for the uh, health insurance and dental. They were both increased by 4%. And the other additional items in the employee benefits, those are contractual benefits that were increased due to collective bargaining agreements. So I'll take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Cruz. Councils, any questions for the director? Council Farwell. Uh, Ms. Cruz, your department handles benefits and enrollment for the entire city, correct, including the schools? Yes, we handle benefits. We here handle health, dental, and life insurance for active and active employees, both city and school, and all retirees. And some civil service re requirements also? Some civil service requirements, actually labor service requirements. There are two different fields of titles. Some are labor service, and labor service does fall under the jurisdiction of the personnel director. Okay. Do you, do you send for the fire and police lists when uh, yes, appointments Yes. I coordinate all that with the, the, person, with the fire and police departments and, and all other department heads on the city side. School department handles their own official service, but as far as labor service, they, that is through the personnel department. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Any other councils have any questions for Ms. Cruz? Thank you, Director. Have a good evening. Thank you, too. Next agenda item is going to be uh, 15, School Department. Kathleen Smith, Superintendent. Good evening, Superintendent Smith. Uh, and before you start, I'd like to just mention who do I see out there from the school committee. I see school committee women Azak D'Agostino, uh, Chair, uh, Vice Chairman Minicello, uh, school committeeman Sullivan, two Sullivans. And I think that's, I did see Tim Sullivan was out there a second ago. I want to thank them for being here tonight. 
Uh, I think that's all, all of your school board did I catch, didn't I? Did I catch everybody? I think you did. Uh, I assume you have an opening statement. Uh, I do, Council President. Uh, first of all, thank you again for having me this evening. Uh, I do want to mention, and I think this was put on your chairs, uh, the State of the Schools address. And I would like to ask a favor of the Council. Uh, last year was the first time we actually had a State of the Schools address. Sometime, I believe it was, uh, actually it was March of last year. This year, things got very, very busy with a difficult budget that we'll talk about this evening, uh, some other campaigns that we had going on. So I'd like to have somebody invite me each year after the mayor respectfully does his State of the City address to be able to do a State of the Schools address. It's uh, filled with good news. It does have challenges in there. And I think it really gives you more than a snapshot of some of the things that we are dealing with when you're talking about the fourth largest district in the state with over uh, 17,500 students. So I'm here this evening to, to talk about the budget. Um, it has been a, a long process. It seems uh, longer this year than in previous years. And the reason that I say that is in preparation for the budget, Brockton took a very active role in what they call the Chapter 70 review over two years. You've heard me talk about being present, uh, and I want to thank my Chief Budget Officer, Aldo Petronio, who truly was present throughout the state constantly talking about the needs of the Brockton Public Schools and positioning us well to have a say in changes that needed to take place in a very antiquated formula for funding public education. Unfortunately, we were uh, disturbed, to say the least, that when the Chapter 70 Review Commission made their recommendations around November, uh, the Governor chose at this point in time not to take into account any of the recommendations for Chapter 70. Instead, uh, late February into early March, we were faced with a new formula for our low-income students, the direct certification. I thank the Council. I won't go into it at length this evening. You joined us in February uh, with uh, Jay Condon and uh, Aldo Petronio going over for us what the impact would be this year on our budget. After that, uh, I want to also talk about the support that we got from our state legislative delegation, making sure that they were front and center as the budgets went through the House, the Senate. We still do not have a final budget, but they were continuing to address the stresses that this put on our budget. So uh, in talking again about the superintendent recommended budget, I will tell you my recommended budget was about $178 million. Uh, which in the end, um, I again thank the mayor uh, for you know, reaching full foundation and as he stated earlier this evening, that is something that we can only go back about 11 years. We're not sure when the last time was that we actually had somebody reach full foundation and this truly was the year that that needed to be done. Uh, the school committee took a look at the superintendent's recommended budget, came up with $175.1 million. Uh, the mayor reaching full foundation uh, brought us to 167.4 million and the shortfall at the time that we have been dealing with and I want to thank my school committee for a lot of hard work, a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions uh, and although we're here this evening to talk about our budget, we still have a lot of work ahead of us this summer as budgets are finalized with the city and the state. Uh, so again, um, in looking at non-net school spending, uh, let me just talk about that a little. Our requested budget this year included a couple of changes. We had a coordinated program review this year looking at our special education department, our bilingual department, our um, tech department, and basically one of the things that they talked about were some corrective actions and it actually included adding a number of vans for our special needs students, making sure that they're getting to school uh, at an appropriate time to make sure that they have a certain number of hours in their day. We also had to take into account uh, the possibility of a charter school coming into the city needing additional transportation. So you will see our requ requested budget under non-net at $8.99 million. The current appropriation is $7.56 million, and our shortfall there is $1.43 million. One of the things that we're looking at, as I said, we still have some things that are moving pieces as far as a state calculations coming in, and as the mayor mentioned to you, we will be watching any additional funding coming in. We've heard, again, there's money for McKinney-Vento. I know the mayor in the past has given that money to the Brockton Public Schools. It looks like there could be some additional money uh, in the budget coming through, and we will continue to look at those amounts. We also will look at efficiencies uh, with looking at our transportation for our buses and our number of students that are taking the buses. So that is our 
non-net school spending. When I refer to the budget barometer and the work that the school committee is doing, uh, I'll try to uh, encapsulate this by just talking about, um, again, once the budget was finalized and we still had a uh, deficit, one of the things that we did was we made a decision to send out over 93 reduction in force notices. And that has to take into account, when you talk about 93, I will remind you that last year we sent out about 120 notices. Of that, there were 60 positions that did not come back in this fiscal year. So we were short 60 positions in our teaching and administrative force. This year, when we sent out 93 reduction in force notices, it takes into account those people coming back from leaves, alternative career leaves. Uh, there were people that were actually uh, rift last year that had an option two years in. If they took a job in another district, they still could come back to our district this year. So because of those moving pieces, we administrators that were red circled in their job, meaning if they were going to be cut as administrators, they went back into the teaching force. So all of that has a so-called bumping effect. So with the 93 notices that have gone out, in the end at this point there will be a total elimination of 59 positions. So out of those 93, I think 34 are already funded and once we get through the process now, we'll start to be uh, bringing them back very quickly before our last day of school, which is a half a day on June 20th. Um, we also had uh, 13 uh, retirements that were not filled and total administrative positions of about 11 that were not filled in this budget. If you also look at some ways that we reduced the uh, $7 million deficit, we had pre-buying. Uh, of supplies and materials uh, from our FY16 budget, pre-buying our special education out-of-district tuition costs, which are allowed to do for uh, the first three months of the fiscal year. So that totals $2 million. We also had an early retirement incentive, $606,000, and that allows you again to take off some of your top paid employees and bringing back lesser paid employees. Um, do not fill from uh, early retirement, $489,000. Uh, regular retirement, uh, $280,000. And that reduction of uh, elimination of teaching positions, over $1.4 million. You'll also note that, again, I've said this a number of times, and I will say this again this evening, that we did look at, I continually hear about the number of administrators we have. I want to mention here that we are a district of, again, 17,500 students, uh, well over 2,500 employees, and what we have done in even reducing some of these administrative positions has only weakened our district. It has not strengthened us. It is going to continue to uh, press all of our administrators that are, are busy from the moment we come till obviously uh, when we leave and even beyond those hours. So I do have concern. I would have liked to have come before you at this point and ask you for some positions that are long overdue. I would have liked to stood before you this evening and tell you I need an early childhood coordinator to really look at preschool and look at some of the <coughs> things we should be doing, especially for this community. I would like a cultural and proficiency specialist in the district when I talk about my strategic plan and I talk about community engagement, which we're actually doing a very good job. That's another outreach, and those were positions that I had intended on including going back to my first days as superintendent. So when you look at some of the other things this year in what I called round two with the school committee, uh, looking at a number of um, extracurricular type programs. We reduced athletics at the high school level, and when, when I say athletics, some of uh, the additional coaching positions. Um, we looked at middle school sports again and intramurals, and I say that also letting you know that the school committee has sent us back to the drawing board with about $200,000 that we have to look at middle school sports and intramurals throughout the district and come up with maybe a reduced program but still an offering so our kids are busy after school. So that's something we're presently working on. Things such as additional money and finishing up our BHS accreditation. Um, we did have a school closing on there. The school committee uh, voted differently. That was on the Barrett Russell. Uh, again, I'm very pleased to have the Parrot Russell open. It's a beautiful kindergarten center, but you know, desperate times calls for desperate measures. And we'll continue to look at our facility needs going forward. 
um, a, a financial literacy program, a, a reduction in our employee assistance program, um, recruitment expenses for HR, uh, grant match funding, uh, Social Sentinel, a program that we had in the district to alert us to some of the social media concerns we should have, um, and a reduction in one of our Champion City Chapter 222 programs. We also pay, made deep cuts into our per capita supplies of $200,000, and again, we had previously cut it $400,000. That's $600,000, and those are paper, pencils, supplies that you provide on, on a regular basis to our students in the classroom. $500,000, again, to our technology, uh, including uh, the cuts that we've made ongoing for the past couple of years, and uh, a number of cuts in a couple of custodian vacancies. Once that was finished, um, I want to talk to you about our growing needs. We have enrollment growth. So we started out on October 1st with 17,383 students. That October 1st is critical for us because that is the funding that we receive from the state on that October 1st date with our per student. We have added an additional 219 students since October, and again, you look at that as students that we're educating without funding for those students. They're obviously in classrooms throughout the district. Our collective bargaining agreements, I just want to make mention again, there has been talk about our teachers. Our teachers are paid well. You know, our teachers are dealing with large classroom sizes. Our teachers are dealing with many of the social issues that we talked about this evening, students in trauma-sensitive school, homelessness. Um, you know, m many issues that we're dealing with with social and emotional health in these classrooms. There are many mandates on the teachers throughout the state right now. So when I look at their contracts, they're very fair. On average, our collective bargaining agreements were 2.2% on average, and that spans all our units, which we have seven collective bargaining units. Our step raises averaged about 2.5% uh, on average. We do have some compliance mandates in here. You'll see $330,000. And when I mention our coordinated program review, there was talk about needing a number of um, ESL teachers. I believe there were two additional ESL teachers. Uh, there were uh, teachers, oh boy, I'm losing my train of thought on that. We had our alternative schools, and we had to come up with uh, an additional art, music, and physical education teacher. So those are a number of our personnel compliance mandates. Our special education tuition rate increases. Every year the state takes a look at out-of-district placements and they will give them over time an increase in what we can expect for those placements. And we also have a lease right now with when you talk about um, digital literacy, and when you talk about the new MCAS 2.0 coming on board, and I think I mentioned last year that the first class that will have to take online testing to get their high school credential, their high school diploma, will be your class of 2019. We are not far away. We need to make sure those computers, those one-to-one -one devices, are in the hands of the littlest child that is sitting in the Brockton Public Schools to this day. We have a plan. We'd like to be purchasing curriculum, making sure that we have our digital literacy specialists and our teachers able to use this in the classroom, not just when it comes testing time. This year, we're implementing a lease for $550,000 uh, with, I believe, about 5,000 devices we will add this year to the schools. So when you talk about Chapter 70 reimbursement, I put in here, looking back to FY14, the changes in this reimbursement. All the way from FY14, we had $11 million of an increase when we had an additional 447,000 students back then and an inflation factor of 1.55%. All the way to FY17, where this year we have $6.5 million less for a decrease of only 20 students less than the previous year and an inflation factor of negative 0.2%. We cannot run a school system when you look at that type of reimbursement when you're talking about a district that is heavily dependent on state funding. And this year I will make note when I talk about that decrease. We were held harmless this year. And again, it is something that we're looking at very carefully, and that had to do with the direct certification and the low-income poverty rate that we have certainly been talking about for months in the district. So what's the impact on students in schools? Um, there, there will be increased class sizes. Um, we're trying to stabilize the district right now to make sure that if you're a kindergartner, you're in an appropriate class. And I will tell you, when I talk to my counterparts in many of the suburban districts that surround us, 
Their kindergarten classes are anywhere from 15 to 20 students, and they're concerned about 20 students. Our kindergarten classes, on average, have 24, 25, 26 students. Many times, our English language learners, it's their first time in a school. So you can understand when we talk about class sizes in a city like Brockton, it is critical that we continue to focus on that. Our uh, district accountability status, well, if I were to say it was in jeopardy, you know, I want to tell you that you, again, are a level three district. You are the only urban district that remains a level three, and many of your schools are level two. You have two level one schools this year at East Middle School and the Kennedy School, and we have a couple. When I talk to the principals, they tell me they're on the cusp for bringing them up that next level. These are, again, people working really hard, making sure that we have coaching going on in the classes, all of the things that provide support to our students. It does concern me that this is my third time defending a budget before the council, and each time it truly has been taking away from the Brockton Public Schools versus adding to it. So I'm hopeful that we can stabilize. I feel good about, believe it or not, where we're headed right now. We have the support of the city. You know, we have the support certainly of all of you. I can't thank you enough for being there for all of the things that we do for kids. We're working again with the state. We're making waves with the governor. We're out there with all of the things that we could possibly out, be out there advocating for our students. And we'll continue to do that because the time right now is critical. As I mentioned, we have 59 teaching uh, positions that remain unfunded, uh, 13 administrators that we had cut, and a number of other administrative assistants, paraprofessionals, custodians. Um, there are some services that are still unfunded going back a couple of years, $2 million in technology, after-school programs, $350,000, textbook and school supplies, $600,000. Parent liaisons were critical in our connections to the community. They were cut two years ago. Mm -hmm. still are not back other than four that we've been able to keep because of a grant. We cut band transportation for away games with our award-winning band. People, people from all over the state, when we play them, can't wait for your band to come and show them the skills of the kids you know, in our district. Professional development funds, critical for our teachers, $200,000. School libraries, unable to be funded. What are the next steps? The next steps are looking at this direct certification of low-income students, putting together our task force to work very closely with the Parent Information Center so we are making sure that we understand how critical it is that when the state certifies a family or a child, it could be something as the letter in a name that throws that child off for not being funded. It could be a name like Barboza. An S and a Z is actually making a difference whether that child counts. So those are things that we're looking at with a very, very careful eye. We're working with our accountability office, our data services office, our parent information center. And for the first time, we're going to bring in agencies in the city, whether it's the Department of Transitional Assistance, the Department of Children and Families, the department that works with food stamps, SNAP with children. We're going to make sure that we're having dialogue so our families understand it's critical that they get the benefits they need and critical that we get funding for them for our students. We have heard that the Foundation Review Committee, and this is coming out of the Senate, has told the governor he needs to look at those recommendations this year. So again, we were front and center for those recommendations. I'm hoping that they're going to be looked at. And what I mean by that is increase funding for English language learners, increase funding for low-income students, increase funding for special education, and looking at an inflation factor tied to health insurance similar to the GIC plan. We're also looking, and you've talked to me a number of times about equity in education. We actually have the attorney lined up to speak to you. We've had, you know we've had a difficult time trying to find everybody's calendar. For her, uh, Sarah Catagnani is our attorney presently who's done research on this. I'm not sure all of it is going to be what we want to hear. Uh, way back when we talk about 1993 and the McDuffie case, the state was truly not doing anything to support the schools. They have come a long way. It's not where we need them to be. It's continuing uh, worth a discussion on our part, so we will uh, certainly have those kinds of discussions. And grant funding uh, expansion. I, that's actually a position I cut this year. It was a position I brought on board back when I came on uh, my first year. Right now, we're going to continue to work with grants, but it is a position that, in looking at administration, uh, it was a position that had to be cut at this time. 
but we continue to look at grants. You'll see in your state of the schools address, we've listed all the grants that we presently have in the district. We have, and what, what's good about our grant department is we have certainly done professional development with every office to make sure we have people throughout the Brockton Public Schools that work collaboratively on grants along with city officials that work with us in different departments to secure grants. And the development of your Brockton Kids Count campaign. I thank the mayor so much for mentioning our Brockton Kids Count. Um, I actually heard Janice Fitzgerald mention, you know, our senior citizens count. Guess what? Everybody counts. This is a great city and a great place to live and bring up children. And it was heartwarming to see your parents out there and the community out there willing to advocate for what they felt their children need. But guess what? We're not stopping here. So it isn't just about a budget. It's really about getting those parents and community members on board and educating them. So every one of them is a voter in Brockton. Every one of them makes sure that they're standing up for what they think our children needs, our community needs. So our goal is we did a little outreach to businesses the few businesses that we connected were fabulous, you know, sent in money. Wanted to, one, one business wanted to make sure we didn't have just small signs, wanted to make sure we had large signs out there. So as we go forward and can finally spend some time on this, we're going to be looking for businesses to join us, looking for foundations to support our Brockton Children Count campaign. And as I said, it'll be much more than just for a budget. Um, in, in looking forward, you know, as I said, you know, I'm actually hopeful. I am hopeful that we're going to stabilize the school department budget. I'm thankful that the mayor has reached foundation. I'm thankful for the support of all of our elected officials, our city council, and truly when I come before you, I thank you because the one thing I know when I stand here is we're all working in the best interest of our children and our community. And I guess I should, I should finish with, I have a fabulous executive team, leadership team, they know, they, they work endless hours, and they are out there, care about kids in the Brockton Public Schools, and I want to thank them for all of the hard work that they do each and every day for all of us here. Thank you very much, Madam Superintendent. Council Monaghan. Yes. Good evening, Superintendent Smith. Nice presentation. <laughs> um, just a question. Are you going to be involved with the mayor's um, grant writing team? Is that going to be part? We will. And when you hear me say that we cut a grant and development writer, as I said, we have plans. We, we've established and built such capacity in each of our offices, our bilingual office, our SPED office, our community schools office. One of the things that we do well is outreach to, you know, the mayor's grant writer, the police department has a grant writer, uh, a number of your nonprofits have grant writers. So obviously we collaborate whenever there is, and a lot of them do want you to collaborate. They don't want to just give a grant to the Brockton Public Schools. So that is something that, that we continue to work on. I believe they even have, they pull together a, a task force that meets on a regular basis to talk about those grants that are out there. Right, right. Well, I'm glad to see you're going to keep after the state for additional funding that we severely need, and they've really... So it seems like they've abandoned us where we, where we put out every year, and you, I think you get as much out of the city budget as possible. To, you know, I don't think you're going to get any, there won't be any cuts at all, obviously, but thank you for all, everything you've done in the school committee and your administrative office. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Lally. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, just a quick question. You were talking about uh, how we had to pay for transportation in regards to the charter school. Mm -hmm. Uh, are we on the hook for that? Are we responsible for paying for transportation? You know what, Councillor Lally, one of the things when your students in Brockton, uh, it wouldn't matter if you went to a Trinity Catholic or another school in Brockton, we are required under the same guidelines for our middle, high school, elementary students as far as walkout zones, et cetera, you know, for those students. So with the charter school coming in, if they are Brockton residents, Brockton students, we would not be responsible for Randolph, we would not be responsible for Taunton. So if they're students that live in Brockton and are you know, so many miles away because it's middle schools, it would be a two-mile walkout. So Deputy Superintendent Thomas uh, is working. We've already met with uh, the uh, executive director of the charter, and we do not have any names from them or students yet, but we will work with them to provide. So we built in three buses, not knowing where they were going to locate or not knowing how many students. And, and truly, I don't even have that information for <coughs> you yet, but it is built into the non-net school spending budget. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Farwell. Good evening. 
Uh, I have several questions, and I'd, I'd like to start by, by saying no one supports the schools more than I do. <laughs> Unfortunately, because of the trials and tribulations of the past, I worry more about the money than perhaps other people. I may have some questions for Mr. Petronio. Uh, on, the other unfortunate thing is that sometimes when people question the school budget, suddenly someone starts a little campaign saying, well, he doesn't care about kids, and I just want everyone here to know no one loves kids more than I do. No one appreciates more that the schools do for us. But I do think we have to have at least some discussions around some issues tonight as opposed to perhaps what we'd like things to be. We need to take a look at how they are. And we are still a city in a financial crisis. I, I don't think anyone can read Mr. Condon's comments and not realize that we have significant challenges ahead of us. So. By prefacing those remarks, I'd like to either ask you or Mr. Petronio, reading the budget book it, and picking up on the comments that you mentioned earlier about how unfortunately we can't buy this and we can't buy that, it appears as though $2,002,000 in FY16 money is left over, so we're going to go out and prepay for supplies and services to help fiscal year 2017. Have I got that down right? That's correct. Okay, so rather than turn the money back to the city, where it would then be available for appropriation, however the mayor and the city council chose, we're spending it down? Is that the, uh, I mean, well, there's no other way to put it. Yeah, well, first of all, when you talk about a $220 million budget, and when you look at, we don't know tomorrow if a special needs child is moving into the city, and needs an outside placement, which we would be responsible for. So like every other district, you have to build in a little bit of a cushion. So that is a cushion that we build in every year. So I'm not coming back to you in the middle of the year asking you for money for those type of placements. We had a very mild winter. So that's something that we can't always count on. But again, that gives us a little bit of a cushion. So you're correct. At the end of the year, and we're, we're still not there. This is what we're estimating. So June 30th, we're, we're trying very hard to make sure all the bills are paid down and the summer pay goes out and all of the things that we have to pay. At that point, you know, I'm hopeful, that, or a substitute budget that isn't as high as we thought that we still have to plan for. So we are allowed to pre-buy with our supplies. So that took, again, when I was talking $7.7 .7 million deficit, that took a million dollars off of that deficit and to me was able to save positions when there are materials and supplies and curriculum we do have to purchase each year. And as far as the out-of-district placements, we're only allowed to, for three months, pay those out-of-district tuitions, and we figure we might have that second million dollars, the way that we're looking at it, and we'll be able to prepay that, which we would have to pay in the budget starting on July 1st anyway. So that helps us out for the next year. So, so you're, under law, you're allowed to take FY16 money and prepay yes. for SPED charges, Three tuition? Three months, I believe. Yes, the law does allow it. Um, as to go three months into the next year. Our out-of-district uh, budget is around $10 million. So we're allowed to do three months of that towards next year's bills. But part of um, the reason we have this pre-purchase and pre-paying of next year's bills is we're funded pretty much right at foundation. So we need to spend all of that money to meet the state requirements. If, if we turn it back to the city, then we will have underfunded this year. Oh, okay, all right. So you're, this, this is one of those the state mandates you've got to spend it, and if you suddenly find you have a surplus, it can't come back to the city, you've got to spend it. Exactly. There were years, many years ago, when the school department was funded a million dollars above foundation. Yeah. In those years, Mr. Condon expected anything over you know, foundation to be turned back to the city, and it was. But over the years, that has come down to where we're funded basically at foundation. So if we don't meet foundation, automatically next year, we start off with what's owed and the state marks it as a you know, red mark against us, saying that they're not meeting their obligation. So well, it's, it's 1.8 million this year that's being made up from last year. Okay. All right, let's, while you're there, Mr. Petronio, let me uh, go on to uh, page two in, in the budget presentation. It looks like you're asking for $350,000 for unspecified positions. You know, give us this money. We think we're going to need it. We're not quite sure what we're going to need, but we want to have it anyway. Correct. Right. There's actually two, lo two spots in there. There's okay. one under certified, one under non-certified. Okay. Every year we set our budget. We start in you know, February, March, April. We start projecting our budget for the following September. 
we don't know how many students are going to be on our doorsteps next September. Mm -hmm. So we've always reserved some money under the teacher's line item and under the non-certified line item because we don't know, for the past few years we picked up three, four hundred children, which means we'd have to put together another eight, ten classrooms, which means we'd have to hire those teachers. So rather than um, not be budgeted for it, we have those line items that are basically additional personnel certified, and additional personnel non-certified. And that's, that's what they're in the budget but, for. But why wouldn't you do what every other department does, and that's go to the school committee and indicate we've got to hire 20 more staff members, have the school committee pass on the appropriation to the mayor, and have the mayor put in a supplemental appropriation. I mean, I'm sure you can see my angst at just saying, here's over a third of a million dollars, right. you hang on to it in case you need it. I mean, I can only imagine if we gave the mayor an extra $50,000 in his budget just in case he needed it, social media would melt down in this city. But I guess people the, would be on the flip side of that, we're not funded over foundation. So if the money doesn't go towards teaching positions, we'll put it towards computers or curriculum or, or books. It'll go towards something within the budget that's needed that'll, again, help us meet foundation. But I reserve it under you know, teachers and you know, certified and non-certified staff. But if we come and we don't need it, that money will be moved. It'll be uh, used in another line item. Because if you don't spend it, the state would be upset. Uh, and the state sends a letter every year to the mayor, and I hear about it, that we're, that we're not meeting foundation because we come so close to it. Okay, there are two items in there for retirement severance. Uh, same number of people this year as last year forecasted. 30 people at approximately $35,000 each. Are those union positions? Yes. And how about, about there are some non-union also? Some non-union. Yes. And how about the non-certified staff buyback, 623,000? That would be contractual. That'd be contractual. Uh, for example, um, our paraprofessionals, they accumulate. Um, sick and vacation time, but they're not allowed to take it during the year. So they'll be paid out on that at the end of the year. Whatever time they, they have not used, it gets paid out to them. All right. And under the, the various school sites, I noticed that there's a 2% salary increase built in for uh, principal, assistant principal, associate principal, and, and clerical staff. But then I noticed that the central administration, it jumps to 3%. Is that customarily you always give out a 2 or 3% raise to these people? Not so much customarily. There are step raises in there. There are longevity blocks as people meet them. So that's a figure. Again, it's an estimate that I use. Someone might, might receive a 1%. Someone might receive a 3%. But those on a budget this large, I do everything in percentage estimates. So I look back. I have about a 10-year running history. I, I look back at it. Lately, I've been doing about 2.6% on step raises as opposed to 25 it just seems that though it's, it's creeping up slightly, but I watch that, and I, uh, you know, uh, one year I, I actually put in 2.7 percent um, for that factor. So All right. I guess my last comment is going to be, and again, it's just my personal opinion. No one else has to share it, but the salary levels at the school department far exceed the municipal side. And I'll give you an example. The Communications officer for the school department, $81,837. The communications director for the mayor for the entire city, $43,889. The director of facility management, and again, not the individuals, the positions, that's all I'm focusing on. The director of facilities management for the school department makes $10,000 more a year than the superintendent of buildings for the entire city of Brockton, who has responsibility for all of, all of what happens in any public building. Um, we have a person in the treasurer's office who's been there 43 years and she makes $61,308 for being, the, I think, the collection supervisor. And you have secretaries in the school department that are making about seventy-five to 77000 These are non-union positions. And I'm just cautioning. You can, you, the fortunate thing is you don't have to listen to me because I'm not on the school committee. The members of the school committee are going to be the ones who have to tackle collective bargaining, the proliferation of salaries, and the impact it may or may not have on the schools. <coughs> but I do not believe that you're going to be able to sustain these ever-increasing salaries and a 3% raise at the rate we're going in a city that is so fiscally constrained. And, um, and again, you don't even have to comment because it's, it's not up to me. It's up to the school committee to try to 
grab hold of this and understand what's going on. But I, uh, those are just two or three examples. I think it would be difficult for me this evening, not that I don't have the information, but to stand here and talk about those type of positions. But I will tell you that one of the focuses I had coming on was taking a look at, we had seven unions in negotiations, so you're, you're very aware that, you know, we sit with uh, the city's chief financial officer and the mayor. You know, we talk about what the ranges are to try to be fair to, you know, to the unions we're negotiating with. Um, we also, when you talk about uh, non-union positions, for instance, when you look at, um, and Mr. Farrell, I don't know if you served on, when you were on the school committee, if you served on the BEA negotiating committee. Both but certified and non-certified. So, so when you look at something like that, I look for BEA to settle their contract, and the highest paid Brockton Education Association member is a 12-month director. They're paid at a 1.50 beyond master's max on the step raises. They come out of the union. The, you know, those are promotional positions for us in the district. They prepare your future administrators, hopefully your future superintendents. That's who's coming through. So when you look at the highest paid one at the 1.50, if I look at executive team members, what that ratio does is it goes up a, sh you know, a small amount to account for the raise and the additional duties. When you look at your deputy superintendents, ag again, the ratios have been built in for years. The ratio goes up a little bit for your deputies, and really your superintendent, when you contract with your, with your superintendent, you're in that same type of a salary scale. When you mention, you know, secretaries, they're in the administrator's union, but you're correct, there are some that are confidentials that have come out of the administrative assistant yes. union, and we've, again, come up with a figure that allows for that kind of a promotional position. They come out of the union. Um, so I'm happy at some point if you want to discuss that, and it, it's just very complicated when you're talking about seven unions and then you're talking about some non-certified members, you're talking about, you know, additional staff members we have. So, like I well, said, I, again, I'm just saying a secretary in your office would make 75 to 77,000. A secretary to the city solicitor, who would handle multiple confidential issues and contacts, the top salary is $50,308. And, and all I can say, uh, Councillor, is when you look at um, the, they're not confidentials. They're a step up. They're called executive assistants in the superintendent's office. One works again with all of the school committee business, all of the subcommittees, and in that are all their evening hours. That is that is a stipend that is also included in their salary. So when they leave becoming an administrative assistant, there is a, a small bump up to a confidential. That's promotional for them. They come out of the union, and then there's one more jump, and those are those two executive assistants in my office. And I'm glad to sit and speak with you about that, how their duties are determined, and a lot of it is a lot of evening hours. I'm sure the school committee sitting behind me would tell you we're probably out, and you know this, you're out. Well, I, I would say the same thing for the municipal side, with all due respect. Yeah. I think the people over here, particularly the department heads who have waited two years, going on three years for a raise, they don't get an automatic 3%. We don't have a foundation budget here. Yeah, yeah, so, I, we don't do but, automatic. Um, again, but, uh, the unions. Uh, we have no foundation, though. No. So I, again, I'm happy to sit and discuss that respectfully, you. you don't have to listen to me because it's the school committee's responsibility. But I'm just sounding a cautionary note to whoever will listen that if that continues, you're going to have salary levels that are so high that. I think it's going to threaten the ability of the city to make the kinds of contributions we need to make to the school system to keep it flourishing as it is. And uh, that, again, just a cautionary note. Um, and I will tell you that before we started the second round of bargaining, knowing what the city is facing right now, one of the first things Mr. Petronio and I did was sit with um, the chief financial officer and the mayor to talk about exactly what we were looking at across the board at all um, employees. Well, I appreciate that. I definitely concentrate on red circling. That's been in there since 1980s and uh, uh, you know the public just doesn't understand it anymore. What went on in the past, they don't understand someone getting $35,000 as they retire. They, it, it's, the support just isn't there. But uh, again, I appreciate you listening to me. I'm just one counselor and one resident and, uh, and I do support the schools but with that cautionary note tonight. Thank, Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else? Right here, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Superintendent. Good evening, Councillor. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for the synopsis. I, I found it, I can only speak for myself, I found it very, very helpful. Um, just three, three questions actually I had. Um, 
on one page, which is the budget barometer, it talks about the total RIF notices of 93, um, but then on the impact on students and schools, the number was 96. It's 59 teachers, 13 administrators, 14 staff. So I was just trying to get what the hard number was. Right. You know what? It should be 13 administrators. There was some confusion when we brought back, I'm sorry, the Barrett Russell School. I thought we had corrected that. Okay. It is 13 administrators and it was 59 um, positions. Two were do not fill, 57 are actual uh, teaching positions that we'll lose this year for a total of 59 at this point in 13 administrative positions. 34 out of the 93 will come back. They were already funded in the budget. We just had to take into account the so-called bumping that goes on when you look at the reduction in force lists. Okay. And I received a call today, and, and I don't know if it's a rumor or not, but I figured I'd ask it. Um, this individual called me as a concert lodge and said, could you please find out if there's going to be four new hires from the school police officers? Well, I don't believe there's new hires. We're uh, told at this point that the um, city, that two of our police officers are leaving the Brockton School Police Force to go over to the Brockton City Police Force. So right now we're uh, interviewing for two positions. Two positions. To backfill the people that are... Correct. Have, okay, okay. And then in terms of your, um, your budget barometer, round two, and it's not a significant amount of money relative to the budget in total, it's 45000 but I just want to know the BHS accreditation cut... What ramifications, what does that really mean? What it means is we uh, budgeted a certain amount of money in the budget the past couple of years. We went through accreditation back in October 2014. And during that year, we had visitors that came out, gave us a report, we passed accreditation, we were approved, but with some corrective action measures. So there's additional money in the... Um, in the budget last year and going into this year because you have a couple of years more of reporting, putting together task forces. So in talking to Principal Wolder, we were pretty much set going forward. We really had covered all our corrective action okay. bases. So we were able to cut out of, I'm, I'm forgetting the exact total, it might have been 60000 and we cut 45 out of it. Okay, okay. So I mean, we will, You know what, I have to tell you, when you talk about a $220 million budget and you're sitting there talking about, you know, ink cartridges, and, and you should be talking about efficiencies. But we have looked, this year when I met with the uh, school committee, we had five new members, and they were talking about going through the whole budget. We had done that for two years running, and you were here. You know how many things we've cut out the past two years I've come before you. This year, if I come before you again, you know, you're truly right. It'll be bodies. I mean, yeah. it, it, there's just no place else to go. You and know, it has I, been I wish bodies. I would like to tell you that we were down students. So when I tell you we lost 60 positions last year, 60 positions this year along with 13 administrative positions, and we're watching those kindergarten numbers, they're not going down. Demographically, you ask any of your counterparts in the neighboring towns, they're preparing for numbers going down. And that is not happening here. So, you know, we're going to open up in September. I have really great concern. I've got uh, Deputy Superintendent Barry and her team looking at every level from elementary classes, looking at what the middle schools are going to look like next year. We open up in uh, September, and I am excited that in this last round of bargaining, one of the things we bargained is a new high school schedule. And we bargained that for additional time that, that as far as the number of classes that the teachers are teaching. They're going from teaching 366 minute periods to four teaching periods this year. So your students can get additional classes, you know, electives, things that they need to get into these colleges that they're, you know, accepted at. So when I look at that, you know, we're, we're again very worried about unrolling that, and this has been almost 20 years in the making. You know, making sure that we have enough teachers to be able to teach those classes, making sure when you talk about your high school, you know, when you talk about 4,200 students, it isn't just about the curriculum, and those kids do an awesome job. And many of you were there this past weekend at the high school graduation. You know, the places they're accepted, how appropriate. I am so proud of those 1,000-plus graduates. But we have to make sure that that is a safe and secure school. Or you're going to get the phone calls, I'm going to get the phone calls, and that means having floor teachers. When people come in and ask us how we operate such a large urban high school, it makes a difference. The floor teachers know the kids. They know the order. They know the passing. You know, there's, there's no quiet time at Brockton High. Nobody gets to hide out in a bathroom. You know, it is a safe and secure school, and I need to make sure, and we need to make sure that it stays that way. Well, I, I want to thank you, and I publicly want to thank you because um, 
you know, we, we as counselors at large, again, have started this quarterly meeting. And I want to thank Mike Thomas, the assistant superintendent, for helping coordinate that as well. And, and myself and Mr. Fowell and Ms. Barnes and Ms. Rodriguez, you know, we've, we've had these. You've been at every single one. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be very blunt. I've been on a council 11 years. Who knows how long I'll be here. But what I will say is we're getting shafted. The city of Brockton gets shafted by the state. We have three great state reps, one good state senator, really working to benefit Brockton. But, but the governor is no friend of Brockton on the city side or school side. So I, I, I'm a little dismayed that the city council and the school committee aren't having those meetings. When I was president, we tried to do. I thought that was beneficial. I'm hoping in the future we will. It's great to see our colleagues on the school committee here. But at the end of the day, you know, we serve the people. Uh, and, and when Janice Fitzgerald said seniors matter, all Brocktonians matter. So um, again, I want to thank you and, and, and you know, we cross our fingers and we hope for the best right now. So thank you for all you do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ranieri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I won't be long, but I'd be remiss as a former school committee member if I didn't have something to say. Correct? That's right, Councillor. That's correct. <laughs> Madam Superintendent, I, I want to thank I you for... Was he? Uh, <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> Councillor, how long again? How long was that? Long enough. <laughs> Took him two and a half hours. You won the pool. <laughs> and, and, and Madam Superintendent, there's always one in the bunch, right? We have it over here. Oh, yes. there's more than one. Yeah. <laughs> in any case, in any case, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, um, just a couple of uh, uh, questions I have as I look over the budget barometer and, and where you've made your reductions and. As I look down, I notice um, there's a couple of assistant principal positions that were eliminated, if I'm correct, right? That is correct. Okay. Um, Where, what locations? I'm, I'm uh, one was uh, the Barrett Russell School. Uh, in the past, we had an assistant principal that functioned as a half-time adjustment counselor. That was her role in the school, and a half-time assistant principal. At this point, uh, I am looking to make sure that that is fully staffed and, and meaning I have to take a look at those class sizes, something I spoke to the school committee about this past month. Um, so we're going to come up with a way of supporting them that is probably a little bit different than has been in the past. Okay. The other one, and I'm very concerned about this, and the one thing that, that we also have to look at is when you talk about 4,200 kids at Brockton High, and when we talk about 1,000 graduates on the field on Saturday, you also have a number of alternative settings that do a remarkable job right. for kids that don't quite make it at our large urban high school. This assistant principal was brought into our therapeutic school, the Goddard, has done a fabulous job with curriculum, uh, bringing on programs for those kids, work opportunities. And I, I may, had a visit with the principal a week ago begging me to reinstate that position. She did not have professional status. Um, I'm going to, again, work as we look at monies that could possibly come in and make decisions in the best interest of the school district. Um, I will say publicly to you here, when I talk about those 60 positions, and Jay Condon and the mayor have cautioned me, knowing that the budget next year is going to be just as tough about keeping those positions out so you're not paying unemployment. That's a cost of about $3 million that if we do not bring them back, we're not paying unemployment. But I have to tell you this as I stand here. If those numbers continue to rise, I'm not going to have class sizes of 35. I'm not doing that. Right. So we will take a look if we have the money, if we look at the funding coming in from the House, the Senate, et cetera, um, then we will take a look at those positions. So it is still, an, and when I started, I said, it really is still a moving budget. Right, right. And, and, and I understand that. <clears throat> but, I, but I do feel... Um, haven't been there. I mean, one of the one of the concerns I always have is the fact that there's not <clears throat> somebody classified as an assistant principal in a building, no matter what type of programs within that building. Because my greatest concern comes now: if the principal isn't there, then who who takes over at that point in time? That's my biggest concern. It's a it's concern. I'll have executive directors jumping in. I right. mean, we, we're doing it's all hands on deck right now. Yeah, and I and I understand that, but I mean that's that's what I don't like to see. A school building without a system principal for that matter I mean and I realize some some years back there, there were some other positions that were created were created where you had principal assistant principal and and I forget what uh, 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 superintendent number called them but the you know the five principles right exactly and there was some a lot of discussion about those positions and the need but I always felt you always need the principal and assistant principal, and yes, you're going to have the correct staff if there's an emergency. But I, but I think it's, um, you know, I, I really think it's something that needs to be looked at, and hopefully it's able to be corrected by the time, uh, you know, September comes uh, comes into play. Thank you. Um, I, I only will echo some of the same. Uh, 
The same concerns, I understand where Councillor Fowler is coming from, and as, as he's mentioned, you know, those are his concerns, but I understand what he's, what he's saying as well, having been over here for 13, 14 years, um, it always does create a situation to um, buy more in City Hall, not, you know, the same as school department, that's always been an issue, and, and I think we have to take a look at that, and he's right, because at some point it's going to get too high out and it's going to, be, it's going to become a, a, a concern um, that, you, that the school department is going to have to deal with and the school committee has to deal with it. I echo the same concerns that um, you know, Councilor Sullivan has um, in regards to you know, the state and how the state's handling us. I, I really have great concerns with that. Um, I was there for the foundation level budget. I understood Educational Reform Act. Um, Councilor Fowler was already uh, was, was gone or, on, or just finishing his term as mayor when um, all that came into place and it gave us tremendous wealth. We know that. Um, but we cannot always lean on the fact that we would always have that as, as well. It was almost, you know, the more you spent, the more you got. So you, you know, you kept going in, in, in the direction to do what you had to do because of the foundation level. Now we're in a different pinch. So it does create a, a difficult um, problem for us. And I know you're working uh, at it, um, you know, the best you, you bet, you, that you can. And I appreciate that. Just one question I do have for Aldo. I don't know if you could jump up for a minute, Aldo. That wasn't fast <coughs> enough. <laughs> I'm getting old. Tell me about it. My question, at one point in time, if, if I'm correct, I think we used to get into like February or March, and I believe the school committee would act on stop spending type. I forget what we actually called it. but We, we freeze the budget. We freeze the budget, and that is still in in place, correct? I mean, to we get to that level? We did. We did that a while back. Okay. And what it is is all discretionary spending is frozen. Only, you know, electricity bills, gas bills, the graduation exercises, only those bills are paid. Everything else is frozen. Right. And I, I think even back uh, in, in those times, you, s you probably did still look ahead and were able to do just what you're doing and, and trying to pre-buy as well. I think we used to do that. I, am I correct? I think exactly. I try and replenish all our inventories. Okay. Okay. But I just want to make sure you... When do you usually do that? March or April? Usually that's then when it used to be. It, the last... We, it's usually mm -hmm. around April. Okay. We're a little later this year. I mean, we had a great winter, so... Um, I look at what is available in basically all the schools' budgets, and I, I look to see if, if the schools are in decent shape, too, so right. they're not, you know, running short on paper. Okay. Okay. All right. I, I just want to make sure that that was being done. I appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, again, Madam Superintendent, I, I thank you for um, your presentation this evening. I know some of the school committee members are here, and uh, definitely I, I think you, you hit the nail right on the head when, when, you know, we all care. We do. I mean, that's what the city is about. Um, and nothing's more dear to my heart is, is, is the school system. I was there to build several new schools and was quite proud to have one in Ward 5 when it happened, you know what I mean? Uh, um, and named after a, a tremendous gentleman at that. I mean, Mr. Plouffe, you couldn't have selected a better name at that point. Um, but, I mean, we're all doing the best that we can, and it's tough, and, and we need to just rally together, and we need to do what we have to do to correct our issue within the state. We need to do that. So i just let you know I'm on, I'm on board with whatever we have to do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. I know. Anybody else before... Uh Councillor uh, Rodriguez. What, did somebody else want to go? Uh, he's already spoken once, so you have Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's about time. Uh, thank you, Madam Superintendent. Um, and I'm, I'm basically going to come back and echo the, uh, the sentiments about the lawsuit that we had discussed some, some time ago. I'm, a, I'm of a believer that I know that the state from time to time tends to toss these little crumbs to the city and somehow we forget about the issues at hand. But I think this time we need to take it forward and go as far as we can go with this because I was looking at some stats and I believe Brockton is in the, um, the bottom 10 in per pupil school spending out of all the major cities in Massachusetts. I think Boston spends 22,000 per student, and I think ours is not even 15,000. So how, you know, for some reason, I, I know what Councilor uh, Fowler was saying as far as the, 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 the level playing field is not as level between the city and the school, and we do agree with that. But at the same time, we're looking at some of these communities that are educating students, and they're spending so much more money. And I'm talking about the Lowell's of the world and the, La the Lawrence's and the Lynn's. 
uh, even New Bedford and Fall River are spending more money mm -hmm. per student than we're spending. How do we go about getting these, these numbers up so that the, our, our students are getting a, a level playing field? One of the things I will have to talk about, I'm not sure if Mr. Condon is behind me, he is. So I will talk about when you look at per pupil spending, it was not fair across the board. You had, what was it, 132 communities who were not allowed to claim their retiree health insurance towards foundation. We are in year two of a four-year plan to be able to have the whole state looking at apples and apples instead of apples and oranges. So that's number one. So sometimes it's uh, deceitful as far as the money that we are spending per pupil now that we're allowed to claim that towards the city's contribution to foundation. That being said, you absolutely are correct when you look at a Cambridge and you look at a Boston and you look at a Wellesley and you look at a Weston and they need foundation and then they think nothing of going two, three million above it for they want one-to-one -one devices for all their students or they want to build uh, you know, a STEM lab or, or whatever it is that they want to do to support their students. So, and they don't have to answer to the state for that. That's above, they've met foundation, they go above and beyond. So when you talk about, and I actually, in talking to the attorney, the one concern I have, and I do want her to be able to share this with you, she said when you look at an equity in education lawsuit, that the state was doing at least a minimal amount of finally with ed reform that came in in 1993. But she also cautioned us to make sure that the state or that the city was using every resource that they have. Now whether that's the full tax levy, whether that's whatever it is, I don't know if that's going to come into play when you talk about going against the state in a court. But the one thing that I like right now is I like that they have brought in this new MCAS 2.0 and that every student to get a diploma conferred by your school committee in order for these kids to go on to college, to career, et cetera, to have that high school diploma and to have that test online. When you talk about kids in wealthy communities, they have one-to-one -one devices and three and four devices at home, never mind when they get to school. I've sat with colleagues in the neighboring towns of Hingham, Norwell, Hanover, and they talk about they have so much technology in the classrooms that they're upset when the teachers aren't motivated to use it enough. That's not what's happening here in Brockton. We need more technology in our classrooms with our teachers. We need, as I said earlier, technology for our youngest students. That, to me, is going to be a discussion as we move forward and they design this MCAS 2.0 that is going to be online in 2019. So I see us moving in that direction. But as I said, I know that we did try to set up a date for the attorney to talk to the school committee and the city council, and we will try to find a time when we're able to either late summer, early fall, when we can come together and hear her talk to us about the, probably the steep hill that we have to climb right now, but worth it to climb it. Yeah, because I know we have a tendency in the city for some odd reason, as soon as we see a little, like, like, and, I, and I keep calling it crumbs, <coughs> As soon as they throw something in our direction, we say, oh, things are all better, so we don't have to worry about these anymore. But we do know that the budgets are going to be, uh, are going to be tough as we move forward. I mean, this year's is nothing compared to what's, uh, what the provision has it for the, fall, for the next, Correct. next coming years. And, and that's why I think we ought to, what, we ought to just push, you know, push forward and go forward with this stuff, no matter what happens. At least we, uh, nobody can actually say we didn't try to do what we can, because I can't imagine how some of the poor communities in Massachusetts. I mean, we've got plenty of them, as poor as Brockton is, but yet they're spending a lot more for their students than we are spending. Mm -hmm. and, I, I, and I understand what you're saying, but I mean, when you look at the overall school budget, these communities are spending a lot more in their school budget than mm -hmm. we are spending, and we've got by far a lot more students than they do. And you know what, Councillor Rodriguez, the one thing that I don't want to see happen is you look at a Lawrence, and they went in four years ago, and they blew up the contracts, and is that really a good thing to do? And they took over the Lawrence and receivership, and they're showing improvements, but the state is in there. That, that's not the Brockton way, certainly. Right. You look at Holyoke, that's what's going on right now. And I'm sure you'll see a turnaround there, but you know, you're right. We need to look at our contracts. We need to look at a way of supporting our schools. Uh, and we'll continue to work hand in hand with you. And, and we agree. I mean, it is critical right now. You know, we understand that this is, as I said, we're trying to educate these kids. We're trying to deal with all of the mandates coming down from the state. Um, you know, I'm hopeful about that equity in education. I thought it was a slam dunk. I didn't like the attorney telling me that there was concern, you know, that we really needed to kind of look at some facts about our own support. 
Um, you know, we, we've been out there as a school district. We, we're trying to support business. We're sitting on boards of the chamber trying to understand, you know, how we can find supports from the schools in, in many, many ways. Um, I, I know we have a tendency of saying we, uh, we get all this help from the state. The state is helping us out, giving us these handouts. But what's sometimes not talked about is the fact that just like we're the fourth largest school system in the Commonwealth, I honestly believe we're also the fourth largest community in the Commonwealth. So it goes hand in hand where our tax dollars are also supporting the state. So the state is not doing us any favors uh, as, as they provide the funding that they should provide to the community. So this whole notion about, you know, shh, don't say anything because the state is providing us with all this aid, in reality, it's not, they're not providing us anything that we, we don't deserve or we haven't really earned. <laughs> Because if you look at it as one of the larger communities in Massachusetts, I don't think the Commonwealth of Massachusetts does what it should be doing for us. Well, the one thing I, I hope you heard me say is, and I'm, I'm, I believe in our parents and our community, and when you talk about the Brockton Kids Count campaign, I do think your state officials, the governor, et cetera, they're not going to write Brockton off. I, I'd like to see them vocal. I'd like to see them out there advocating along with us. So it's not just us. It's not just elected officials. It's not just, you know, we need to, and we have a lot of work to do still. We need to make sure that the teachers, that, you know, all of the, you know, all of the different unions, that everybody is on board with us, you know, to, to talk about Brockton Kids Count. Because we do make up the largest part of your budget. And finally, I just wanted to um, honestly uh, thank all the folks in the, uh, in the school department, especially the folks at BHS. I mean, I was at the, at the high school graduation this Saturday. I spent parts of my morning today ranting and raving about our school department. That's great. And what, because when you look at over a thousand kids graduating for that, from that school, and the thing that gave me goosebumps was the fact that 89% of them are going on to college. And that's something that we, we tend not to talk about in this community because for some reason it's a lot more fun to talk about the, uh, the, the, the sky is falling and the, the, the the gloom that's coming all over the place, but when in fact when you're looking at the number of children that we are educating in this community and the fact that 89% of them, 89% of them are going on to go to college and, and acquire uh, a higher, higher learning in the sense, it's something that we all should be proud of. And I just wanted to make sure, because I, I, I know I tend to be a, you know, the, the glass is helpful, you know, helpful um, uh, guy here, but I just wanted to make sure that I communicate that across because uh, you folks deserve a, a lot of credit for what took place over the weekend at the well, on Council, the field. Counselor, you looked like you were having a good time at that grade. I was, grade. A I was grand sweating. Old time. You were having a good time. But can I, you know what I did leave out? It's not fair to leave this out. I do have to say to you so, awards and accolades Kennedy Elementary East Middle, level one status. Established that UNIDOS Portuguese uh, immersion program in September 2016. We're very excited about that. We have the kickoff coming up this week, I believe, on Thursday. I graduated over 1,000 students, as you said, 89%, two and four year colleges accepted. One of our students got accepted at seven Ivy League colleges and six other students are accepted at Ivy Leagues. Um, we were awarded uh, an award for the number of students, and these are our students, our English language learners, that are increasingly taking AP and international baccalaureate courses. So we, we know, again, the diversity we have at Brockton High School. Some of them, you know, first time in their families to be able to go on to college. So we're very proud that they have access to those programs. Our student, Jailton Texera, first place uh, in the uh, 8th Congressional District Art, going to be shown uh, at the Capitol in Washington, D.C. Uh, many honors for scholastic art, writing, drama club, selected at the state finals. I went to that state finals. You are the only urban district represented there. So when you talk about 14 schools in drama throughout the state, you've got the Wellesley there, you've got the private schools there, and you've got Brockton High School there doing a fabulous job. Um, we had, again, New England uh, Patriots cornerback Malcolm Butler choosing to come to West Middle School and talking to the kids there about a program that they started for uh, buddying up with each other and basically a no bullying. Uh, excellent job. Uh, 293 John and Abigail Adams scholarship recipients awarded scholarship to attend our state colleges and universities and we're still named Newsweek America's Best High School Bronze Medal 2016. So I'm glad you reminded me I would have walked away without talking about all the wonderful things. And I see Councillor Azak smiling. I know her daughter attends Brockton High School and is very involved in uh, a number of the activities, as so many of you attended uh, yourselves. Well, thank you, Madam.
Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Councillor. Just going to. Councillor Azak. I'm very proud that my daughter goes to Brockton High School, so I'm sitting here just holding. We're very proud of you. Thank you for all that you do, and uh, Superintendent Thomas is great to work with. So I just want to, anytime we've needed anything on the city side, he's always been there to help us. So I want to make sure that I recognize that tonight in the school committee. So thank you for all you do. And I talk forever if I had to mention everything that I went to at Brockton High School that we're proud of. We're very proud of our kids. And thank you for your support. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else before I go to Councillor Sullivan? Councillor Sullivan. Chairman, I just had one follow-up question. Um, and maybe it's for Aldo. Um, relative, Mr. Petronio, relative to the, uh, the transportation, um, last year, to his credit, Council Rodriguez brought up a, a, a valid point that the city pays the busing company a ton of money, a ton of money, and that they should say Brockton Public Schools on the school buses, and that was incorporated. My question is, do you know a guesstimate how much the, the bus company gets paid? For a student directly from yes. us? Six and a half million? Six and a half million. So, so my, my question is, relative to the direct services still unfunded, you're talking about 10 grand relative to transportation for the BHS band. Has, has, they, has there been any conversation with first student to say, hey, listen, you're making six million bucks. You know, to t 10 grand is nothing. Drive these kids to the establishment that they should go to. It's the right thing to do. Has any conversation been brought up to them? No, it's not. Do you no, think that not. maybe it could be? Sure, uh, Mr. Thomas handles that, but I mean, I, th I, I just think that's a no-brainer. I mean, you're talking about a, a band that's recognized, you know, if not throughout the Commonwealth nationally as well. And when you're talking about six million versus ten grand, it's 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 when you go out to RFP for these type of services, um, you need to really disclose in the RFP that. No, I understand. Do I, that. I, so believe be me, I understand that process. But I'm just saying, as an act of good faith they may say, okay, this year we'll be able to bring the kids to sure. six away football games or whatever it is. Sure. All we'll right. Thank comment. you. I pre appreciate sure. that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Rainier, you had one more question? I, I did, Mr. Chairman. Just to, just to follow up, and, and I do want to um, mention this to, uh, to the superintendent and even to the school committee members that are here. I know that when um, all the budget process had begun, which was in um, mid-spring or whatever, um, I, I know one of the greatest concerns that people had was they're talking about school closings and of course one of the rumors that went rampant naturally was the fact that the Huntington School was going to be the school that was going to be closed and uh, it was uh, my school committee man from Ward 3 Mr. DiGostino that uh, caught me bright eyed one morning and I think it was about 10 or 6 if I'm not mistaken he said sorry to bother you but he said we have a problem and I says okay what's the situation and we talked about it and uh, you know he was doing his piece to what he had to do as a school committee member and, and I said I would do whatever I had to do as council and naturally um, to maintain that that building be there. And we both met I think it was just a few evenings after that with the, with the parent group that was um, there at the Huntington School and that was a great concern. And nobody knew what direction other than there was some talk about it. But in seeing the situation in a little bit more clarity and, and <coughs> the fact that I know you and your staff and the school committee were going to go through the process to, to make sure that there weren't any school closings because we know what type of effect that has on a school system and, and especially what it would have done to the Huntington School in itself because um, as he and I both know and, uh, and I live in that neighborhood, that school is meant for that neighborhood and I think that's most important. At some point in time, we have to take a look at it. At some point in time, hopefully we're all taking a look at the fact that we need a new school on the south side of the city. I hope, and I still will be here, I'm going to do whatever I can to make that happen as well because I, I think that's what has to come next. But I just want to thank you for not letting it go too far out, and it didn't. Uh, the barometer was pulled in on it, and, and everything turned in a different way, and I think that was a positive for, for that neighborhood in itself, to be truthful with you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Councillors, thank you, uh, just Chairman. before we move on, I actually have a comment I'd like to make myself. First of all, I want to commend the high school staff and Mike Thomas the graduation process for to get a thousand kids out in about two hours is amazing uh, but more importantly the uh, the, the facts that uh, Councilor Rodriguez was talking about uh, as a graduating uh, the father of a graduating senior the high school those numbers I actually went to another graduation yesterday at a fairly affluent town in Western Mass and the percentages of where they have children going did not approach what Brockton High has going on this year, so uh, and almost every year. So it's an amazing job we do up there. And then just one pet peeve of mine about graduation, I bring it up to you every year. 
Um, you mentioned the alternative schools. Those kids work very hard, some, in some cases harder than the other kids to graduate, and they always seem to be put at the end as an afterthought. There's no reason those kids can't be put mixed in yeah. with the other students. They've earned that, they've earned that right also. Yeah. So it's just my pet peeve, and it's my fourth year in a row, I think I've mentioned it, and uh, hopefully by next year we'll uh, <coughs> mix those kids in as a part of the Brockton High School because they've earned their diplomas also. Thank you. And Councillor Rodriguez and I had a conversation on Saturday uh, for a brief moment during the graduation. A and I agree with you. You know, we will work something out to make sure every kid is comfortable with the graduation and every family gets to enjoy such a wonderful moment in the And it is a great life. moment. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillors, if there's no objection, we're moving along pretty well. Uh, I think we're going to. Uh, Ms. Schechner, you all. We're going to move on, if there's no objection, and take items from Wednesday night 13 through 16 the uh, auditor's office and I'd like to actually well you'll be happy Wednesday night that we did this counselor and I'd like to actually comment that it's nice to have uh, auditor Chucker in here she's okay. missed the last couple of budgets due to health uh, issues and it's great to have her back full-time okay. and uh, feeling so good Thank so you. madam clerk item number from Wednesday night item number 13 auditor Heidi Chucker city auditor no questions we'll give you all a minute to get back to your big books The big boy books. Uh, any statement? No. No statement. Uh, any questions for the auditor's office? I would just make a statement that uh, we have many uh, evening meetings also for all those people in the, uh, that work for the city side of the budget too, and th those people are here also uh, for many hours, and, uh, and we don't get to feed them. <laughs> Any other questions? No. <laughs> Item number 14. Auditor, mailroom. Heidi Chakran, City Auditor. Uh, actually, perhaps you could just give a brief explanation for the new councillors what auditor's mailroom is as, as a separate line item. We actually are in responsibility of the mailroom, so this is uh, the postage for the year, the postage machine, FedEx, um, etc. Any questions? Mm -mm. No. Any questions? Madam Clerk, item number 15. Auditor, telephone, Heidi Chakran, City Auditor. If you could maybe give a brief explanation for the new councils of this one. This is the telephones for the city. The actual landlines that um, everyone uses. Oh. <coughs> Any questions? No. Item number 16. Uh, I'm sorry. Item, yeah, 16? item 16 is yours also. Retirement non contributory. Heidi Chakra. If you could give a brief explanation uh, of this also. We have uh, one person on this uh, pension payment plan still. I believe this was in place before actual retirement system. That's why there's only one. So, councilors, these are people that were before we went to the uh, current contributory yeah. pension system. Any questions? Who's that, Stud? Bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <Did I? laughs> Thank you. We finished that. We'll save Mr. Condon for uh, Wednesday night so he can finish up everything, anyways. Uh, councilors, good job tonight. Uh, 6.30 tomorrow night. We'll see you here. Amen.